Yep. My hat seems lower today. Pulling up the notes. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap number 109. I'm going to hit start recording, and I'm going to start over. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance, weekly scrap number 109. My guest tonight is Nicholas Papa, Lieutenant with New Britain, Connecticut Fire Department, where he has served 14 years and is currently on engine company number one. He started as a volunteer, has experience on both sides. He is a second generation firefighter, FDIC instructor, articles published, and of course, coordinating ventilation. And that's the new book that just came out this year. I'm ate up with the book and we're going to talk a lot about it. He's also served as a technical panelist for the UL FSRI studies. He is the founder of Fireside Training and Nick Papa. It is my get, my pleasure to have you on as the guest of Weekly Scrap number 109. Welcome, brother. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be, be on. I appreciate the invite and looking forward to, to diving into the conversation tonight. Awesome, man. Okay, getting here, getting this set up, making sure I got everything going. Rob Fisher said, hell yeah, with two exclamation points. Nick Esposito said, yeah, man. We've already got people logging in and getting going. Uh, house cleaning right out the gate. Uh, my Mid-America Fools, my chapter, has the Mid-America Fire Conference coming up this weekend, the 22nd and 23rd, Friday, Saturday. Um, if you're in the area and want some, un it's Ray McCormick is the keynote speaker. Um, Justin Lorenz is going to be speaking there. I try to think of everybody. I'm going to leave people out. LJ Geis is going to be speaking there. It's going to be a good time. So if you can be there, be there. Hands-on training on Saturday. So uh, that's that. Art of Reading Smoke, December 8, 9, and 10 in my home department. Rob Backer coming in to teach us all about smoke. So tickets went on sale today. So that's my two housekeeping things right out the gate. Nick, is there anything I left out in your intro? Anything you want to add? No, that's more than enough. Right. I appreciate that. That's to everybody logging in, we're about to go and get extremely nerdy and down and dirty about ventilation. So I hope you're ready for the ride. Right out the gate, you ready? Let's do it. All right. I wrote down a bunch of questions right out. And, and I want people to understand this. I'm not just going to, I mean, although the book is, I can't say enough how good the book is. I want two people to understand this book is a, is a melding of uh, science-y, getting into formulas like I, I forget I, I should have wrote down the notes so much formula and science stuff mixed right in with like street level uh experiential firefighting and that's what makes the book really really resonate with me uh, and that's where where I wanted the book to to land Corley and it it thrills me to to hear you say that because I wanted the book to be a one-stop shop so to as you you said earlier in the pre-show, it scratches the itch for the guys that are really looking to to tear uh, mm. tear apart and look under the hood and and figure out every nut and bolt of, of how the tactic works and how it interfaces with all other operations on the fire ground and and how it influences victim survivability. Um, but and they can take that deep dive into the weeds and go it go as far down as the book will allow them. Right. Which is, is, it goes pretty deep, um, but also. Somebody just wants to get though to just mine the, the just the tactical the, the nuggets that they can take to their next fire and just get a, a, a generic you know better understanding of how ventilation works and how they can um, more effectively and efficiently apply it to have the intended uh, outcome that they're looking for. Then the book will will suffice for that too because you can when it starts getting into those that that uh, heavy lifting if if it doesn't. It, doesn't suit you or you're not interested you can just keep right. on going yes. and, and and just stick to you know the, the street level aspect of the book so that's where I, I wanted it to land because i was uh i got a chance to talk to uh captain john cirillo at a, a conference in new jersey a couple weeks ago and i really love the way he uh he approached his teaching because he was a uh, uh, he did a talk on ventilation and had com uh, complimented him ab about the presentation he said he goes i'm just a conduit of information and i love the the just not only the humility that he showed i mean right. this is the captain of rescue one in manhattan the guy that is, has accomplished so much and here he was just completely sloughing off that that compliment and just saying and it was, wasn't only just the humility but it was just the importance of uh, of our fire instructors and, and educators and in the sense that 
what we're trying to accomplish is to pass along uh, knowledge and help uh, develop that uh, understanding for others so they can learn from from our experiences and also you know a lot of those ex uh, those experiences and lesson learned are often you know learned the hard way and, right you know you know forged in you know blood sweat and tears so if we can you know make that process a, a lot easier for for folks down the road so they don't have to you know fall into the same traps and and repeat the same errors that we did then that's what this is all about because if helps out one person and keeps them out of the jam or enables somebody to execute their job, you know, that much more effectively. And it results in, you know, them saving a life or saving somebody's property, then I don't care. You know, if, if I make a penny off of it, that alone is, is worth its weight in gold. And that's what we're, we're, we're all here for as, as fire service instructors and educators. Hell yeah. That's awesome, man. No, um, absolutely. And, and that's, one of the most well, uh, and I read a lot, but it's one of the most well uh, footnoted, and and all your sources are there for those who want to deep dive into anything you that you reference. You can you can absolutely go down a rabbit hole with this thing, or you can just enjoy the anecdotal and 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 the referential and the yes, and it's it's really really not to just sit here and harp on the book, but I was very impressed with that mixture because it's a lot of people aim for it. It's very hard to hit. It's either too deep in the weeds or it's very too shallow. And that's another thing that um, I'm so glad that you recognize too, was uh, I was extremely diligent in citing all of my sources because what I wanted to do was create a, a I hate to say one-stop shop, but I wanted to, to create a central document because I, it, there's over, well over a hundred uh, sources that I directly cited in the creation of this book. And I, you know, have thousands of, of man hours in the research and development of, you know, this book and which is based off of the program that I teach. And when I look back of, of the, the lengths that I had to go to track down some of these documents and in some of these books and, you know, some of the books I had to, you know, scour eBay for to right. they're out of they're out of print or, you know, that I needed earlier editions. It so I wanted it to be this information to be accessible and to cut through, you know, the, the, the pieces that weren't relevant to the street level firefighter or fire officer and just get them the, the meat and potatoes of, um, of what was relevant to the fire ground because, and this is something that we're going to get into later on is the difference between knowledge and understanding. So we, you know, the, I love it. You, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't have a practical understanding of that knowledge, that knowledge is only power when it's useful. Right on. And, and we can practically apply it in our particular setting to solve the problem that we're being, that we're encountered with. hundred percent. And the last thing, because I haven't even got to the first question yet, but I don't want to keep harping the point, but I literally today spent like 10 minutes on guy Lusak, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Guy Lusak's uh, like law yeah. calculator that a Google search sent me on because you referenced Guy Lusak's pressure law or whatever. And I'm typing in, all right, a 10 by 12 bedroom, you know, eight foot ceiling. And I'm typing it in. I'm going, it starts at 72 degrees. And I'm like, what's the pressure? Anchor? I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. And that's the kind of rabbit holes <laughs> it sends you on. Or you don't have to mess with it at all and just get the, no. the point that you're making, which is, hey, we don't have enough ventilation openings, you know. But anyway, um, I'll get to the first question now. So uh, let me catch you up on everybody that's talking here. We got Jeremy Donch said studs. There's a Jersey guy. I'm clicking some likes. Brett Lyle says, what's up from Kentucky? All hell rep said, yo, that's Everett, my man. Robert Queen, good evening from Ohio. Thank you, brother. Corey Braunschweig, let's get it on. And then Robert Queen said, great looking hat. Hey, I actually, he said, great looking hat. I made this one today from a patch that... Chris sent. I actually left Shane Bentley and Bears of the Oath, the other one that had the side patch. So this one, I didn't know if the patch was too big, but it worked out pretty good. So I'm pretty proud. All right. Caught up. Dominic Dominguez said yes with the fire. Okay. So first questions first. Chapter one, you lead right off the edge and you already, we already started edging around the edges of this, but gate and um, talk about the mental preparation, meeting and melding with the physical reps, the why we do what we do. So I love the the point you drive home right out the gate on this. So this is something that I'm really passionate about. And when we look at 
how we train our firefighters, especially new firefighters, it, there is a terrible deficiency when it comes to the fire behavior and fire dynamics training that 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 most most of us uh, received in our fire academies, because even uh, the states that that you know follow pro border if SAC and you know have all the the credentialing, they are they're following at the very least as a baseline with the requirements of, of the hours for, per subject. And in most cases, it's as little as four hours of, uh, that's required for fire behavior, mm. which to me is is criminal. Travis, because when you think about it, building construction and fire behavior is the foundation upon which all strategy and tactics are framed. So if you don't have a solid foundation built on fi uh, fire behavior and fire dynamics how can you truly understand how all those tactics are intertwined with each other? And how can, if we don't know what the effect those tactics are going to have on the, on the fire behavior and on the fire ground, and most importantly, the victim survivability, are we really making the decisions based off of what's best for, uh, for the victims and what's, what's going to have the best outcome? Or are we just, you know, following standard procedure or just doing what we've always done out of, box, right. you know, habit or habit or mimicry. And, or, you know, we're not we're not really you know critically evaluating our our situation and, you know, making coherent decisions in the moment. So that's where I think we need to you know realign, you know, uh, the hours and, and really start to take a hard look at, you know, the foundation that we're laying for our, our new firefighters. And then not only that, once we've established that foundation, we need to be fusing and inter uh, intertwining those same principles and lessons in each of the tactical aspects throughout that fire academy. So you know, take, for example, something you know, like forcible entry. You know, it's making that connection of, you know, when you create uh, create any opening, regardless if if you're doing it passively just to make entry into the building, you're still ventilating that fire. Right. You're providing fr you know fresh air and letting out products of combustion. So the, the fire has no clue what your uh, your motive or intent is for creating that opening. It's just going to react to it because it's bound by the laws of physics. Right. You know, so in, you know, another thing that that Cirillo, uh, Cirillo had said during his talk was that, you know, fire behavior in, you know, in how our, our it reacts to our tactics is fairly predictable, you know, but we for it to be predictable, we have to understand, uh, yes. you know, all of those basic principles and tenets of fire behavior and understand, you know, those that those rules that the fire is bound by, which is, you know, the laws of physics and just basic, you know, ke uh, chemistry of fire. So it, that that to me is is critical and just overlaying those lessons throughout all the aspects of the academy. So we're in, we're you know reaffirming and instilling those things through all facets of, of training. So it's not just you know, uh, you know, teaching to the the curriculum so they can pass the test and you know rattle off some some definitions, you know, so, simply so they can uh, get certified. It should be much deeper than that, and we shouldn't look at it as just this check the box training. Yes. And, oh, we got to we got to get through fire behavior, guys. Sorry, you know, it, we shouldn't be looking at it like that. We should be taking it seriously because. You know, this is what set, sets us up for success in all other aspects of, of the fire ground and allows us to, to to make sound decisions. Dude, without a doubt, man, I think you just nailed so many uh, problems in the modern America, uh, modern American training of our new firefighters. You just you just knocked it out of the park on that. And a lot of people agreeing here. Mark Isom said most fire academies are meant to set the student up to simply pass a state standard test. The real learning gets done in the field. And I think that's probably like the standard out there <clears throat> whether i mean not the standard it should be uh which i think is your point rob fisher fire behavior and building construction are on equal planes for engine and truck operations more of a reason why they should be the two most important topics discussed in the fire academy i could not agree more um without a doubt I had a question here i wanted to scroll back to that's why i put an angry face on it so if anybody wonders if you get an angry face it means i want to find your question among the <laughs> comments and so don't use angry faces is what i'm saying i'll switch it back i promise i won't stay angry but sherry renee said what was the app you were referencing and it was actually uh a guy lusak's law i don't know where it comes from i never heard of it until i read nick's book but basically you could type it in google and there was a calculator 
and you could type in square footage and temperature and then say what does the temperature increase to and it will tell you what the pressure will increase to and it's just kind of a really deep nerd calculator you can deep <laughs> deep dive off into and that doesn't even include you know how the volatility of the gases etc so so it, I'll give the, the quick Reader's Digest, you know, firefighter friendly, de you know, definition quickly, just because so, anyone's, I would say most people are probably think it, have no clue what the gay Lusax <laughs> law even is, because in in all in perfect honesty, until you know our our report came out for the uh, study on coordinated fire uh, fire attack and acquired structures came out. That's where I first got introduced to it. Now, most of us, especially anybody who's been through uh, Aaron Fields' nozzle forward program, is aware of, of Charles' law. That's you know we've heard about the, that um, you know water expand you know water expands 1,700 times you know when it, um, it it's converted at 212 degrees. Um, so we, we're we're familiar with that. So we understand the expansion of the gases as they're heated. Well, Gay-Lussac's law looks at the kind of the inverse of that, which is we know that gases expand as they're heated, but they proportionately contract as they're cooled as well. And you can see how that directly correlates to the fire ground because, oh, yeah. you know, th this is one of the other problems when it comes to ventilation and our, our education on ventilation is we only focus on one side of the coin, which is typically the exhaust aspect of it. We're always trying to, we're, we're always honing in on, you know, letting the byproducts of combustion out, releasing the heat and smoke and the other products of combustion. But, you know, go, uh, back to Newton's third law of motion, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So <laughs> just like when you have, have exhaust, you have to have intake to support that exhaust because without that, uh, that air exchange taking place, you don't have a continuous flow of air. And for anybody that sat through any of my classes, I love to make very simple analogies. All right. So, you know, the, the, the PG version I use is, you know, being a 90s kid, you know, the, the you remember the, those old school, um, you know, the thir the 32 ounce uh, cans of high C okay. you know, that they, they used yeah. to have. And, you know, you, you have to use the <laughs> old school can opener to open them up. Well, if you tried pouring it out with only one hole in the can, what happens? The right. things, you know, spluttering and, you know, pouring out terribly and you end up spilling your, half of it around your, your, your glass that you're trying to pour. So what you need to do is put the second hole in the, on the opposite side of the can. So one's an exhaust, one's an intake, and that's how you get your continuous flow. So, or if you want to use the, uh, I was going to say, more is it shotgunning so, a beer? Okay. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> All right. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the non P, you know, G rated version that, that, that I use for, you know, when you're just talking to firefighters. So, but yes, it's just like shotgunning a beer. So it's a, once you, you know, once you cr uh, crack that can open, that's what gives you your, uh, your proper intake to allow for your smooth exhaust. So it's, it's the same thing as we got to look at both sides of the coin uh, because that's, that's really how it functions. And we need to understand that, that intake dynamic, just like we need to understand that contraction of the gases and the effect that that has. There. Okay, good. The end of it died, so I didn't know if I lost you. Are you there? Nope. Okay, making yeah, sure. You good? Okay. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. It it the 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 fade out coincided perfectly with the sound dying, so I wasn't sure if I lost you. Um, <laughs> no, perfect. Uh, someone asked for a link to that gay gay loose axe. I gotta say it right. I keep saying guy. So uh, I posted a link to the. That's just a Google search. I don't know the proper one to use or anything. That's just a Google search one that I found earlier today. But it was fascinating to me to type in the stuff on there and mess with it. Uh, if you're a fire nerd you'll find it fascinating. If you just want to beat down doors more like a trucky style, I don't know if you'll be infatuated with it like I was. Uh, I wanted to throw something at you here though, right out the gate. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call an audible and deviate and say, what are the biggest misconceptions that you found recurring about ventilation as you've studied and written this book and, and of course taught? I mean, I, I know this is a curveball, but I, I really want to hear what your answer is. All right, so this is that's a pretty loaded loaded question. <laughs> now, uh, and they all kind of they both kind of tie back to uh, to timing and in the conditions at the at the time that ventilation is taking place. I would say the two biggest misconceptions or you know biases, however you want to frame them, right. is you know does ventilation on its own confine fire, and does ventilation alone in, you know improve you know tenability or you know reduce reduce heat. 
Mm-hmm. So now one of the biggest, you know, kind of retorts to, to, to this or, you know, that this assumption has been been made because I'm sure most of us can recall being on a hand line or, or, or you know, crawling down a hallway and being, you know, pressed down with heat and, you know, having conditions, you know, really banked down. And then either the roof, the roof gets popped or, or a window opposite us get, gets opened up and conditions dramatically improve. Yeah, you get that lift. Exactly. Right. So everyone, you know, it talks about this, this, this lifting effect that occurs that, that, you know, essentially, you know, it gives us this, this feeling of, of lifting of this reprieve of, of the heat. <laughs> yeah. The in, reprieve. That's in, a great, yes. Go yeah, ahead. So it's, it's a remarkable experience when, when you feel it take place. So that's what we, we often rely on. But this goes back to you know, something that, that you had mentioned to me in the, in the pre-show, which was it's this misconception that ventilation is a global, uh, a global effect on the right, fire floor right. itself. Now, you know, even I was under the misconception that, you know, well, OK, that that may be the case for, you know, for window venting. But, you know, vertical ventilation, you're you're creating an opening uh, above the fire. It's It's got to draw everything up and out. But the key to remember is we need to have a very thorough understanding of that intake and exhaust relationship mm. because it, it's it's in, and understand where the openings are within the building, because that reprieve, that lifting effect is only going to take place mm-hmm. where that fresh air is tracking in towards those exhaust points, which is typically, you know, uh, opposite or advance or, you know, above the seat of the fire, because, you know, just. To, to frame this in, in an example that everyone can conceptualize is, you know, you take a basic, you know, ran, or ranch style home, single, you know, one story, single family dwelling, entering through the front door is our typical uh, point of access. So that's going to be our, our principal intake. Now, say with fires down the hallway in the bedroom, we go in through the front door, we turn down the hallway, that's our approach corridor. And then, you know, ideally we have either a vent, uh, a vent opposite within that fire room or a vertical vent dire- uh, directly above. So where that, where that reprieve is going to be felt is between the front door and between that, that exhaust point, which is either, you know, opposite or advance or directly above. Even in the other bedrooms that are directly off of that hallway, they're going to remain um substantially unaffected by by any ventilation even even vertical unless they have their own source of intake because think about it even though that uh, they share that common hallway and even if the doors are open if that room if those remote spaces those adjacent rooms if the window's not open or we don't open them there's no source of intake and if no, there's no source of intake there's no air exchange occurring right. between um, that intake pathway, which that fresh air is tracking right down the hallway and towards uh, uh, towards the seat of the fire, in either you know out the window or up through the roof. So that's critical for uh, for us to to understand that uh, understand that dynamic, especially as it relates to to victim survivability. And I know we're uh, jump ahead a little bit here, but I really want to pull on this thread because it's it's so critical from uh, evaluating our tactics uh, from no. the victim survivability standpoint, because especially for those that are are resource limited, where you really have to prioritize your uh, the tactics that you implement. You know, for me personally, extinguishment and in primary search have to be at the forefront of uh, of where we uh, um, devote our resources to. Um, Ventilation is by nature a support function. Ventilation is is a systematic effort that's done to support uh, the fire attack, the search, and then uh, you know to improve overall victim survivability. Right. But it is a support function. It's supporting the fire attack and supporting the search. And then everything we do ultimately is designed to enhance victim survivability. Yes. So we need to look at it because if we're if we have very limited staffing. It, it, am I really going to have the best benefit on uh, on the overall outcome of, of any uh, trapped victims that may be inside by devoting what little resources I have to the roof? If I could accomplish that, you know, um, 
just uh, just as well from uh, from another means and more efficiently carry out the primary search. Now, again, don't don't confuse what I'm saying here. I'm absolutely an advocate of vertical ventilation and it absolutely uh, has it has its place. Um, and if it's one of those things, if you have the resources to the, the ultimate goal is to simultaneously accomplish all of these objectives at, right. uh, at, at once and, and, and initiate these tasks. If you have the, those, unfor- the manpower. Yes. You know, in a, in a perfect world, we'd all be able to, you know, properly staff the, you know, the hand line, you know, back it, you know, back it up with, an, uh, with another, you know, have uh, the, the enough people that we need to, to efficiently carry out the primary search and, you know, whatever means that, that that's going to uh, require and, you know, be able to accomplish horizontal and vertical ventilation uh, to you know, evacuate the, those byproducts as quick as possible. But unfortunately, that we most of us don't live in that world. Right. You know, um, my department uh, does have uh, have a, a lot better staffing that, than most. Um, you know, it's but it's it's still not that I don't think there is a such thing as ideal staffing. But for the rest of the fire service that really has to triage those uh, those uh, tactical objectives and in, in um, those tactics that they're implementing on the fire ground, they really need to look at this uh, closely and say, you know, first and foremost, do I have enough people to st- properly st- staff that hose line to get it into position um, to stop that fire in its tracks? And do I have enough people to dedicate to that primary search to occupy those uh, those remote spaces to aggressively uh, initiate that search? So I can locate victims and improve tenability within those spaces. So one of the, the ways that that can be accomplished from the from the interior is those crews that are that are conducting those primary searches. We talk a lot about uh, door control as it pertains to, you know, I don't know. I don't care which what you call it, whether okay. you use V.E.S., <laughs> V.E.I.S. That's entirely up to you. I actually have abandon the use of the acronym for the most part altogether and i just use either conventional search or targeted search targeted search okay um and actually even uh, talking with uh, the folks at ul today they're doing a similar thing just because there's so much contention regarding the the whole acronym debate sure. and they're using the verbiage which i absolutely love which is door initiated search versus window initiated search Ooh, i like that so th- that's and, along and, that same and it's a great point of when the debate gets in in front of the tactic like it becomes more important than the than the actual effectiveness man sorry go no and and i, I think that that was the same theory that i had about using the conventional versus targeted in in uh, my the verbiage i used for the book to avoid that um that argument altogether because it, it's we're, we're getting uh, we're getting past the point here so just like door control, we we advocate it very heavily for the, the vent enter search tactic is once we you know create that opening, we want to get in there and immediately isolate that space to you know, pre- you know prevent that connection between the area that we've just vented and the fire area itself. So we're, we're not drawing the fire to that new point of low pressure. Well, the same concept can be taken from the conventional or door initiated search in the sense that if I get into that uh, that remote room off the, off the hallway and I close the door behind me now au- automatically I've made conditions better inside that room I'm preventing any uh, further contamination of smoke and fire gases I'm reducing the thermal insult by creating a barrier effect between um, the fire and the area that I'm searching now as I initiate the search and I hit the outside wall and I find a window I can do that that old school tactic, which I'm sure anybody who's been in the fire service for for more than a decade has probably heard the term "vent as you go," especially from a, oh, yeah. a more a, a more yeah, senior firefighter. Yes. yes. Now that term is pre uh, is pre SCVA firefighting. Uh, that term of "vent as you go" was was born out of necessity. Now I'm I'm going to go down another. I like rabbit history. Hole. I like history there, lessons. Another, another go. rabbit hole here. And this is a, a, a conversation that uh, that I've had with, with Aaron Fields before, and um, he really kind of illuminated this for me. And you know, he was a, a huge inspiration and uh, for writing this book and my and my diligence for for citation and going back to the history. But one of the things that he's been talking about a lot was uh, I uh, I got to uh, sit through another one of his his classes uh, in Jersey as uh, that same weekend that I got to hear Cirillo speak. So it was, uh, it, was a, like a, it was a home run weekend. The, the double beginning of the month. 
Oh my God! And then uh, Vinnie Dunn was there. Was, okay, uh, so the trifecta, yeah. tremendous, tremendous. So, anyways, he talked about how this is something that I've written about as well. Is that we've, uh, in a lot of cases, we've lost touch with the lessons that uh, that our pre-SCBA predecessors had learned because they were on the sa- on, on pretty much the same playing field as the victims that they were going in to protect. Right. Now you think about it, these guys were wearing either the, the tin or, or leather, uh, leather helmets, the, you know, the uh, rubber or canvas, the flannel or, or the flannel line coats, the orange rubber fireball gloves Fireballs, and, you know, yeah. pull, and, and pull up rubber boots. So they were like in, 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 encased in, in rubber they, you know, no respiratory protection, no flash hoods, no nothing. So these guys were on a much more level playing field with the victims. So they had a much greater appreciation for what the environment was like and how it was evolving because they appreciated what it was like to not be able to breathe. They were subjected to a lot more of that thermal insult. So they understood when it was time to open up that line because they, they didn't have a to. choice. Yeah, they didn't have a yes. choice. They didn't have the thermal protection that we have now where you could pretty much get yourself into a, you know, a pre flash over condition before you really start feeling any appreciable heat. Right. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. I've been in places that I absolutely shouldn't have been and wouldn't have been if had, had I been in that, that same level of protection as th- those individuals. And without any real discomfort until it was too late, too late. Um, you know, but if you get touch, to the point, that, the compression touch is like, Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So whether it comes to you know, us not opening up the line sooner when we should, you know, because not only was it the relief from the heat, but also they were breathing off the nozzle because when that line was open, they were in training they more were, fresh yeah, air from the- behind them. <laughs> and that was that that line of that breathing off the nozzle. So the same goes for the guys that were searching as they were searching ahead when they reached those outside walls. They had to smash out the windows in order to, to, to get a blow and take a breath so they can continue on. So that's but the, you also have to remember, too, is they were in a that that legacy, that legacy fuel environment where. Now, listen, plastics have been around since the 1950s. So that, like this isn't some, you know, just uh, spot uh, um, emergence of of plastics pervading sure. you know, our, our lives. They've been slowly creeping in since the 1950s. But now instead of it being, you know, speckled like it was for them, pretty much now everything is is yeah. synthetic based to some extent. So we're dealing with essentially solid state gasoline in, in, in some uh, sense or another. So the timetable for, for these folks was was a lot uh, you know, longer than it is for, for us. Our margin for error is much smaller. You know, while the fires aren't necessarily, you know, you know, the the peak temperatures aren't that much hotter. The rate that at which they're getting there is is four times as fast. You know, you look at and the pressure, you know, synthetic, the pressures, yeah. And that that's all tied together right. because you know when you look at, at, at synthetic fuels versus natural fuels side by side, yeah, uh, you know the the heat output per pound is double for for synthetics. And then, but what's more alarming is that it, they rele- uh, release their heat four times greater. Right. So that. That's why our, our timeline today is very different and why we have to be much more fine-tuned and, and disciplined in our actions because we just don't have that, that grace period that, that, that they had uh, to work with. So where, where they could more freely vent as they, as they went, if you will, you know, we, now with us, when we get into that room, we close the door, we take that window, we've now isolated the space. So now that ventilation that we create doesn't have a, a direct pathway to the seat of the fire. That's not a, that's no longer a low pressure point for the fire. So now we're going to get that immediate air exchange. We're going to get that lift within that room that we're trying to search, which not only is going to um, improve tenability down at the floor level uh, for the victims, but it's also going to allow us to, to move that much faster that's because the, now uh, vision, we can, we can see visibility is going to increase, you know, the, whatever heat has pent up within that space is going to start to be relieved. So like I said, it's uh, one of the panelists uh, from the study, uh, Chris Byrne had uh, kind of made the connection is it's essentially it's the, it's the inverse of VEIS. So instead of us, you know, uh, venting the window, climbing in, you know, isolating the space or making entry, isolating the space by closing the door and then searching back. 
you know, we're making entry from the interior, closing the door behind us, searching, and then, vent, you know, venting to, to facilitate that. And then the, the beautiful, so if, if the fire is not in check by, you know, uh, a flowing hand line at that point, you can continue on with your search as long as you close the door behind you after you leave. If the line's in position and has the fire in check, you leave that door open and now it's just going to further facilitate the, the ventilation uh, of, of that space as well as the, the rest of the, the structure. Beautiful. So is, so that, that's something to keep, to keep in consideration as well. And that all ties into the, the timing aspect, because if we distill down uh, the, the timing aspect to its, uh, to the most core of like decision-making, it's, if I'm about to cre create an opening in the building, do I have a charged hand line um, that's ready to move in and capable of flowing water and reaching the seat of the fire? Um, if I don't have that, am I able to isolate the space that I'm venting from the fire? Okay. And if the answers to, uh, to those two, uh, to either one of those two questions is no, then we, we can't do it with, I'll, I'll, I'll say the, the only exception to that being a, uh, a known life hazard where we have confirmed entrapment because then that that totally changes the game that's our um that's the exception to to the rule in that in that case uh, but we also have to to understand that if we if we ventilate an area that um is not isolated or that we can't isolate um immediately upon entry we have to understand that's going to come with that inherent risk of drawing the fire to to, to that point that we're uh, that we're venting which has always been the case and we've always well, we've always understood that but right. it's just part of that um that algorithmic approach that i like i, I like to use and i love it um, i love i love that right there i just wrote down boom on my notes and then like hit it a few times because that's good at 35 55 no 100 i want to hit you with a couple things i'm not going to do sean robinson's yet because that's a bigger bigger fish i'm going to hit nick esposito he said let me change it from an angry face to a like <clears throat> Nick said, knowing how we got to where we are today based on the operations of the past should also be a part of basic firefighter education. It would fill in quite a few gaps in our understanding, dude. And I think, I mean, you alluded to it. He expounded on it. And I think that's just beautiful. Yeah. So, and it's, and this is what I, what I love about what uh, UL FSRI is, is doing. And I think a, a lot of the misconceptions in uh, our, our, slowly being it being chipped away and uh we're starting to bridge that gap between this the science and the street where if you really look at the especially the the latest coordinated fire fire attacks to, uh, study that was done the the vast majority of what's in there is quantifying and is invalidating what our predecessors okay. have been preaching for all along now if you go way back in the text to you know Emanuel Freed and you know Lloyd Lehman and then all the way back to the 1800s with James Braidwood. James Braidwood really was the first one that, that I'm aware about that documented the, the, this whole concept of flow path, which he referred to as the draft. And also, you know, Emanuel Freed in, in the 70s you, utilized that same terminology of the draft effect. And that was in Braidwood's book was was uh, was published in 1830. Yeah, and you referenced so it, it, it a couple times, at least that I saw. At least, yeah, because it's tr it's tremendous. I mean, he's bringing he's up like, these close very the window. <laughs> yeah, unless you right. want it he to talks, burn hotter. Yeah, it, he talks about the the importance of you know making entry through the front you know front door and you know um, you know keeping keeping the, the the door closed until we're ready to move in with water and you know even in the 1800s, which was pre SCBA, you know he was preaching the importance of, of uh, interior uh, interior fire attack mm -hmm. and you know it, he's you know talking about the the disadvantage of it, disadvantages of of uh exterior water versus interior water and you know having those conversations and it's it's amazing how the, the similarities and how and a lot of times we're we're actually saying the same thing it's just like we're we're too busy trying to you know prove that 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 either side is right, that we're not listening to the similarities. Right. So it, it goes back to that, that old Tom Brennan uh, quote that he used to say, which was um, you, uh, you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. Mm. And, and essentially what he, what he was saying was that like, we could, we could each be, be right in our, in our own regard. And, and it's, that's especially true when it comes to firefighting, because it is so, you know, jurisdictionally driven and, um, is so in, heavily influenced by, you know, just our building stock and our resources and our individual capabilities. 
But you know, at the very core of what we do in, in the principles and practices that have been in place for decades, if not centuries, are, you know, are, are sound in that what the, the data has actually been able to quantify and is bringing to light is essentially just validating uh, what these ge gentlemen have been uh, preaching all along. And it's, it's, a, it's a really great thing to see that right. as more time goes on and, and the studies evolve and the technology evolves, you know, that pendulum is, is swinging more towards center and things are starting to align more. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping for as, time, as things progress on even further. I love it. I love it. And I want to hit you with this one, which is not, are you good for a, are you good for an audience question? Cause this one's open. Oh, let, it's very it short, very short. I don't know how you feel about it, but Sean Robinson wants to know, Nick, what's your take on positive pressure attack? <laughs> All right. Well, first I have to you know preface this and I'm, uh, I'm surprised you didn't even go there. So uh, in the intro, obviously you, you introduced me, I'm an engine company lieutenant. So, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that are, are scratching their head saying, what the heck is a engine lieutenant <laughs> doing teaching on ventilation? I will, you know, qualify that in saying that when I kind of journeyed down, down this rabbit hole, um, I just gotten promoted off of a ladder company um, when this all started, started to go down. And, and I never intended for this to turn into what it did. And uh, I only kind of journeyed down this rabbit hole to create an internal program to help, you know, educate, you know, uh, my coworkers and, and, and help bring this, uh, bring this to light. So, you know, guys weren't making the same mistakes that I, that I had, had learned the, uh, had to learn the hard way. Right. Um, but when, the, as time went on and I went back to the engine company and, you know, I now went from the, the guy that was performing ventilation to now the guy that was requ uh, requesting or confirming it. And I was now on the receiving end of it. So if you think about it, that outside then of that roof firefighter never gets to reap what they sow. They, you know, simply just take the glass yeah. or cut the hole in the roof. And their metric of success is did smoke and fire come out? OK, and if it did, like then, hey, you know, in, in their in their eyes from from that perspective, they're uh, they accomplished their objective and did what they were supposed to do. Whereas going back to the engine and now being on the receiving end of ventilation gave me that much more well-rounded appreciation for the tactic because who better to speak on the timing aspect and coordination of aspect of ventilation than one of the, the, the most consistent or the consistent benefactor of the, of the outcome, which is the engine company uh, that's making the push down the hallway and is, is making the attack because we're we're at the forefront of that. We're we're going to be that that guaranteed benefactor every time. Where yes, we're also venting to improve tenability for victim survivability. But you know the the there's no, you know we always go under the assumption that that there, the building is occupied and we treat it as such. But you know we're the ones that are consistently getting to gauge whether or not that that timing was was dialed in and whether that uh, that intended effect was achieved or not. So that's where I. I I think that this this has one of the been the, one of the best things for my career was going back to the engine and getting to experience it now uh, back again from the other side and now now I'm the one actually um, ordering or confirming right. that that ventilation the taking ventilation. place so uh, I'm much more you know um, tuned into it and acutely aware of of you know my decisions and how they affect us um, so you know, to. Do you mind repeating his question real quick? I kind Positive of pressure gone attack. off on that. Too. It, it, okay, it's, so it's, yeah, that's where we okay. were. Okay, so now, so now to so now to touch on that. Positive pressure attack. I will say that my my fire department has never has never done it, and it's not part of our 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 tactical decision making uh, model. Um, with that being said, you know, with my um, understanding and experience with it through uh, the UL, ULFSRI coordinated fire attack study. Is it a viable option? Yes. Are there pros and cons to it? Absolutely. And they're very clearly spelled out in, in, in the studies. But in my opinion, unless you're flush with resources, and even if you are, to me, the, uh, why would I add a, another variable that has to be controlled and that adds more layers of complexity and there's now more potential for mishap um, when I have in or when I'm already, uh, I have the ability to organically perform PPA with a flowing and moving hand line. Right. So to me, 
why would I need a fan to do what I can do with my 15th, 16th inch smooth bore right. and my crew flowing and moving down that hallway? Because once I get on that approach and I open up that hand line and I start moving it um, and manipulating it around and I create that pressure front because now I'm in training that fresh air from behind me, um, you know, 5,000 CFM at 150 GPM is getting entrained in along with my hose stream. And if I'm doing, if my technique is good, I'm able to seal that approach corridor. I'm preventing the, the fire gases and byproducts of combustion from coming overhead if I've created a good enough seal, which now, you know, creates uh, more of a, a unidirectional or a pure intake at the front door. So I'm maximizing that fresh air intake. And now ideally I have a vent opposite or above me within that, that fire area to now push those products of combustion as I create that pressure front. And now with a vent opposite, that fresh air will actually entrain past the nozzle through that intake pathway and out as it pushes the byproducts of contracts combustion and push out. And everything all combined. Exactly. Woo, so woo. to me, why would I why would I have a fan do what I'm perfectly capable of doing myself? And I have the ability to control it. That on off switch is the bail. That nozzle firefighter is 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 essentially creating that pressure front when they're good and when they're good and ready to so again it's just i'm not a big fan of adding complexity you know adding more room for for error and it's with ppa just like with all forms of, of pressurized ventilation it, re, it it requires the proper ratio of intake to exhaust and depending on the output of your fans which some of you know the the larger gas uh gas powered fans can be over twenty thousand cfm um, so that's a substantial amount of air. And now you put that in the context of, you know, a 1300 square foot ranch, you know, you need, you know, sometimes upwards of five times the, 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 the outlets to compensate for that, that introduction of all of that, that air that we're in training the into the structure, area. because if you don't have sufficient exhaust, what's going to wind up happening is we're going to over pressurize the, the structure and you're going to wind up with, um, large scale mixing and creating all this turbulence so it's going to actually, you know, hamper that that air exchange instead of it being a nice smooth exhaust. So to go along that same lines, um, I'm also a huge proponent of hydraulic ventilation. To me, that is one of the the, the biggest lost uh, arts of the fire service. It is I don't know why in a lot of places hydraulic ventilation is has been forgotten about. And I don't care if you have a smooth bore or a fog nozzle. If you haven't picked up already, I my experience is largely with smooth bore nozzles. That is what I, I if I had the choice between the two, it would unequivocally be the smooth bore nozzle. So a lot of people will say, oh, you can't you can't hydraulically ventilate with a smooth bore nozzle. Well, first of all, uh, I don't choose my nozzles based on their ventilation abilities. So nice. that's one. And two. I can absolutely uh, hydraulically ventilate with a smooth bore nozzle. Now, this is something that they're they're they were able to uh, quantify scientifically with with data with the, the current search study that that's being wrapped up right now. Because um, unfortunately, we didn't get the, the we didn't have the instrumentation, the numbers to to quantify it with actual data. Um, but we d we did it in certain parts of the study, and I, it, it's standard practice in my fire company where after uh, we've knocked down the seat of the fire, you know, the nozzle firefighter will immediately spin the tip off of the smooth bore, half bail the, uh, that nozzle open. And now taking the tip off is now going to, you know, create that, you know, uh, that inch and a half inch opening where the, where the threads were, which is now a, a wider orifice. It's, you know, you don't have that, you know, it's like the, the rifling of a, of a sure. barrel. You know I mean, you're, you're just, you know, the openings, there, there's no, you know, you know, sheathing around the opening. So it's just a, that, that blunt opening. And now also we, um, by half bailing it with that ball, that ball valve is partially occluding the opening. So again, that's that, Ber that Bernoulli's principle or in, you know, simple firefighter terms, it's holding your thumb over the end of the garden awesome. hose trick. <laughs> Okay, so we're 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 breaking apart the the, the solid slug into you know you know uh, breaking it apart into larger droplets, and then we're also increasing the water velocity, which cumulatively is increasing air entrainment. Now we can double down with that even further with you know the further back from the opening that you are, and the more that you manipulate that stream within the opening, the you know the more you're going to increase air entrainment as well. Right. So you know to put this in uh, so. Uh, with uh, with a, a fog nozzle on a narrower wide stream, 
Yes, is that gonna um, gonna be the the most efficient and produce the most CFMs? Absolutely. But I can have a, a comparable effect by pulling the tip off and half bailing that smooth bore, especially when I um, when I agitated around in a you know in a, it may have to be a tight O pattern to fit within the opening. But as as if I'm agitating, the more I agitate that stream, the more air entrainment I'm I'm going to cause, and it, it, the effect it, that it has is is tremendous. Right uh, a fire that I had uh, last <clears throat> winter time it was a top floor, floor job in a um, uh, six story. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, low rise uh, uh, apart, uh, apartment house. And this is 150 foot long hallways fr uh, from end to end with no, you know, compartmentation in between the fire apartment door was left open and the entire hallway from end to end floor to ceiling was completely contaminated. So after we made the push down the long hall, uh, my nozzle firefighter knocked, knocked down the, uh, uh, the apartment. Uh, we had a nice big bank of windows. It was just a, you know, it's a low income efficiency apartment. Right. So, but we had a nice big, uh, you know, uh, bank of windows, right, you know, like right in the center of the apartment. So he immediately pulls the tip off, half fails, and starts just whipping that uh, that stream around inside. And you, we went from completely lights out, like smoke bank down, end to end, floor to ceiling, and it was like somebody just lifted the curtain up. To the point where the uh, uh, my my partner, the other officer I work with on the ladder company, came up to me and he's like, he goes, "Man, because I, I, I couldn't believe how quick that uh, uh, the conditions changed when you guys started hydraulically ventilating." Like I said, it was literally like somebody you know flipped the light switch and immediately started drawing Just out. It, yeah. So the now, reason why I I also you know uh, favor hydraulic ventilation is because you know, it's using negative, uh, uh, negative pressure instead of positive pressure. So we're drawing uh, or immediately drawing the products of combustion out of the fire area instead of having to pressurize that space to, for, uh, to, to force it out. So it, it's to, to me, it's I don't need any more equipment than what I already have. I don't need any additional personnel. And I could and it's inherently coordinated because I can initiate it's this, the same people that just knocked down the fire are the same people that are going to be initiating that hydraulic uh, ventilation and it, and it can be done instantaneously after knockdowns achieved. And that's the beautiful part. And there's always going to be, uh, uh, there's almost always going to be a window present within that area that we just knocked down, especially in the, you know, the, uh, the residential setting. Now I want to hit you with this because I, I feel like the, a lot of people in the audience have this same question. Rick Bergen asked, he said, and this is the greatest way to ask a question guys ever. If you say, pardon my ignorance, but I'm new to smoothboard nozzle. So when you qualify a question that way, man, it's such a great way to ask a question. Um, how do you vent with a smoothbore? What is the technique? And a lot of people in the chat answered the question, but I wanted to get your take. Cause you, you mentioned you already touched on half bell, but just walk through it just, uh, again. So again, this that at this point, this is uh, this is purely anecdotal because we don't have the data to back it up scientifically. But uh, I've been to enough fires now where I've seen this technique em employed firsthand, and the effects are, are dramatic. I mean, I wouldn't have known any difference uh, whether we or what type of nozzle was being used. So we simply, you know, um, just unscrew the nozzle tip off so that way it's just the shutoff valve. And then you're, I found that the half, the half bail position to be the, the, the sweet spot for this. So in doing so with, with half bailing, the ball valve is partially occluding the waterway. So not only is that breaking apart the stream, but just like when you hold your thumb over the end of a garden hose and you're partially occluding that opening, as the water uh, hits the end, it's being now funneled, into, uh, funneled through a smaller orifice, which increases its velocity. And you know, the more we increase velocity and the more we increase the droplet size, the more air we're going to entrain. Now the we movement, can for, the movement, movement plays into that. Amazing, yes, the right? movement okay. plays into it dramatically, especially with the smooth bore. Anything that we can do to further enhance that uh, the air entrainment is going to be a benefit. Um, and this could also be applied for for a narrow fog as well, depending on how big your opening is. The more you agitate that stream, the greater your air entrainment is going to be a, uh, be as well. So I just simply stick to have my guys stick to the simple O pattern and just you, know, you stick to the confines of the uh, the opening size. And the more you agitate that stream, the more uh, air you're going to entrain. And it's pretty you, it's pretty incredible, the effect. And you could, you know, uh, if you weren't wearing a hood, you could probably, you know, feel the, the air do, rushing, yeah. rushing Passion by on, on your ears. I mean, 
uh, once you get it going good, I mean, you literally are watching, you know, the smoke starting to, you know, whiz by you. It's it's pretty impressive, especially as it starts to, you know, to lean out and things are starting to uh, to lift. It's pretty it's pretty impressive to to watch. So that that age old argument of, um, you know, the fog superiority because of its hydraulic ventilation capabilities to me is just it's a dead issue. And I like I loved your when you said I don't pick my nozzles based off how much air they can or you know off their ventilation technique. So. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's crazy. I mean I mean it's a somebody had made made a meme about it and, it, and it's. It, going to the far end of the spectrum, but it'd be like picking your, your, uh, your saws based on their ability to extinguish fire. I mean, it, it's, it's insane. That's not, that's not its, it's uh, primary purpose. Is, is that a, uh, a valuable, you know, fringe benefit of it? Absolutely. And yes, yes. The fog nozzle is, is better at doing it. It is more efficient because it's going to naturally entrain more air. However, you know, again, this is like be a matter of splitting hairs. I mean, you're talking, you know, you're not going to notice, uh, you know, one or 2000 CFM on the fire ground. Right. You're talking right. a difference of, se- of seconds. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of, I know most of us can't control what type of nozzles we use because most of us aren't doing the purchasing or the influencing of the purchasing. So it's just knowing what you have, knowing its capabilities and limitations and using it to your full advantage. So you can leverage, um, you know, leverage those, pro- uh, those pros and have the greatest impact on the fire ground with what you have. Nice, nice, and that really does cut it down. Um, I'm trying to feel what, I'm, dude. I'm looking at my questions here. I made it to like question two before we went just like organic. Oh, I, uh, I knew this was going to happen, so, uh, and it's great. I, I'm it's trying great. to figure out which one we haven't hit on here. Uh, the point I want to I want to hit on this: the point of diminishing return for any ventilation tactic. That's a that's a term in the book. I mean, a, a sentence in the book that really stuck out. Can you define to me what you mean by that? So there's a bunch of us in, in our teachings and writings where um, uh, we, we use some of the, the financial financial terms like return on an investment, I think, is, a, is an excellent term, uh, term to, or phrase to use, especially when it comes to, um, to resource allocation and, and what we're pri- and how we're prioritizing, um, because we need to get the, the most bang for our buck, especially when we're not flush with, with resources. Uh, but there's also with ventilation, there's a point of diminishing return. And this goes back to the, those misconceptions and those biases is will, you know, ventilation Im- Im- improve conditions or, or confine fire even on its own? Well, it, yes, it does have the potential to do that. But going back to my, my simple analogies, I like to, to compare uh, the timing of ventilation like the fuse of a bomb. Now, based off of the conditions that we're faced with, and that that's going to be everything from um, the, the size of the building, um, this where where the fires are located within that building, uh, where the openings are, what's the orientation of those openings, you know, in, inlets uh, inlets to ex, uh, to exhaust points, and also their orientation to the fire, because that's going to determine whether we have, you know, that unidirectional or bidirectional flow. So, you know, and you know the efficiency of that flow. Also, what stage is the fire in and what's the fuel load and all of these different variables are going to, you know, to play into, you know, how quickly the fire, a fire reacts. So that's going to be essentially determine the fuse of the bomb. So if we, the, the further away our, our point of intake is from the fire, the longer that, that, fu- uh, that fuse is going to be, because uh, a misconception is that people think that if we create an opening, regardless of where it is, the fire is just going to instantly grow and things are going to get uh, get worse. What we need to remember is that, like, take opening the door, for example. Let's go back to that ranch that ranch scenario we were using. When I open up the front door and the fire is down the hall in the bedroom, that fresh air, uh, we have to, we're also get, we're going to get a dump of that pressure and smoke that's built up within, within the building. Right. We're going to get a bi-directional flow. We're going to see, uh, you know, that that smoke tunneling where we have that lift of the smoke as it's being discharged and it's being replaced by that fresh air that's tracking into the fire. But that fresh air doesn't just transport itself into the fire room. It has to get there. Now, uh, on average, UL found that that it was taking it was uh, traveling in at, at roughly about five to ten miles an hour at, at, okay. un, under normal conditions, if there is such a thing. Not like a wind driven they, van or something. Yeah. So right. under just kind of like the the normal you know uh, right. atmospheric conditions, you know that that homeostasis, if you will, um, about five miles an hour is what it's going to be tracking in at. 
based off of that typical sing single family dwelling uh, layout, it's going to take on average about 10 seconds for it to arrive there. Now, based off of where that fire is located, it may be sooner. If the, if the living room is on fire, obviously it's going to be almost instantaneous because as soon as you open the door, that fresh air is going right, right in there. towards the seat of the fire. Whereas if it's in a bedroom down the hall, it now has to go across the living room, down the Track hallway, the in, and yeah. then in, into, into the bedroom uh, for it to then exchange. So if you think about that, that 10 seconds as, as, as that, for example, if my hand line is charged and, and ready to move in when I open up that front door, and let's say the, the, you know, that engine one to ladder one OV, I'm moving in. Ladder one uh, ten, OV 10-4. Window gets taken. We move in. You know, barring any extenuating some circumstances, how long is a proficient engine company going to take to move in that, that 10 to 12 feet till they get to that, that junction point, make that 190 degree turn, whether it's left or right, Go another, Push you know, probably fifty, you know, ten feet on average down down the hallway, and then make that last ninety degree turn into the bedroom. It's two, it's two nineties, and you're probably going a, a, you know, a whopping, you know, thirty, 30, 30 feet, feet total, yes. thirty feet cumulatively. Yes. So a, a proficient engine company is going to be able to accomplish that in mere seconds. So we're going to be moving in right behind that fresh air that's in training in. So that's that, you know, keeping that in perspective. So obviously that fuse is, is going to vary in length depending on the, on those conditions. Right. Are, yes, are there going to be times when we need to be uh, more di uh, uh, conservative with our, our timing of ventilation? Absolutely. If we have um, you know difficult interior conditions, whether it's full blown hoarding or even just you know a lot of contents where the, it's just slowing slowing down our, our normal approach, or do we have as, as you touched on uh, any kind of a wind impacted condition? Um, there's a, a, a multitude of different variables that uh, that could come into play here that um, that could alter uh, alter our um, our timing aspect. But by by and large, as long as a charged hand line is moving in, is capable of flowing water and reaching the seat of the fire, so we can you know take control over that space. And you know th this is why I'm a, a huge advocate of the, of the flow and move because it's it's a positive capture. All right. So once we're on the approach and we start flow, uh, flowing water. You know, whatever space that we've taken, we own that space. That's ours. And when we continuously flow and move on the approach in, into the fire room, we don't give an inch of that real estate back up to the fire. All right. So that's ours. Right on. So I have that 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 hand line is able to 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 take it uh, to take and, and control and that space. Yes. You know, so it's it's taking and maintaining it as 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 you said. Oof. So that that's what's 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 key there. Um, so that really ties into that, uh, that, ti that timing aspect. And I like those, those simple analogies, but yes, we, we are going to get that initial lifting. If, if we're on the same level of the fire, um, you know, as long as we're not, you know, ab above the seat of the fire, like in a below grade situation, you know, we're typically going to get that, that lifting effect and we're going to be able to capitalize on a, a some degree of lifting and improvement down at the floor level. And, you know, if we create an, an opening above uh, the fire or opposite or advanced within that fire area, yes, that, that opening, that exhaust opening is going to be able to confine a certain amount of fire. Now, uh, again, with my, my analogies, um, openings are just like drinking glasses. You fill it with whatever your favorite beverage is, but it can only hold so much. Right. And once we, once we over, uh, overwhelm it, start to overflow. A vent opening is no different. Yes, it can. If you create it in the right spot, it's yes, it's going to channel and uh, all of those byproducts of combustion, the heat, the smoke, the fire out that opening until it reaches capacity. capacity. Once it reaches capacity, just like a drink, a drinking glass is going to overflow with liquid. That vent opening is going to start to overflow, and now that that ventilation is is cannot keep up with the output of the fire, and it's going to start to seek other points of low pressure. Which in that that same uh, example that we've been using, if we created the if we if the outside vent firefighter took that window in the fire room, if we don't get, if we're not ready to move in or or we get hung up or, or we're otherwise unable to flow water, once that window gets overwhelmed, that next point of low pressure is going to be the front door of where we're uh, we're, we're looking to make entry from. Right. So it's going to seek that next point of low pressure. 
and you know start moving elsewhere, which is going to be laterally typically in the opposite direction, which is where we're approaching in from. So this is you know why it's critical that if we're, we don't have that charged tail line moving in that's capable of flowing water and, and taking control over the, the approach corridor, that we need to control that door behind us. Right. So to, to make this clear, I'm not saying that you have to keep everything buttoned up and we can't go inside until the, the hand line's ready to move in, that it couldn't be anything further from the truth. If you have a, a dedicated search crew that that's that's ready, you know, you know in, in my my agency, we have, you know, dedicated truck companies, which they s split two and two and then inside crew, their primary function is initiating that uh, that search. That primary, okay. You know, if they're ready and in position before we are, as long as they, uh, you know, they let us know that, you know, they give us that, give they, the, the officer gives me that tap on the shoulder saying, hey, I'm moving in ahead. That's that that, right. that sacred oath, that bond that we've created now in between us, that accountability that, hey, they're moving in. And as long as they shut that door behind them, they're not going to create any problems for themselves by in, uh, introducing fresh air to the fire in deteriorating conditions uh, uh, in, as a result. So they can then you know, move in and start uh, initiating their search and you know, hopefully you know, identifying the seat of the fire if they can confine it by you know closing that bedroom door, um, this is why if if you are going to initiate searches or or, or uh, have a crew advance in ahead of a hand line, they have to, they've got to have at the very least a two and a half gallon pressurized water can with them. Okay. Um, that's huge because no, no, I can't argue. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's incredible the amount of of, of knockback power that uh, that a water can has. And you know that could be the difference of you being able to conf uh, confine and further compartmentalize that fire or not, because if the door was left open, but you can't you know, you can't make the reach in to, to shut the door, that you know uh, the can firefighter can start knocking it back while the other firefighter you know you know grab you know, either hooks hooks it with the, uh, the the six foot pole, or you know reaches in on their belly and you know sh gives a quick sweep as they shut the door. Um, that'll it gives you that ability. So it's bu it's buying you that that time, right. and that, that's a, and that's especially true too, uh, with um, it, you know if the door is starting to burn through too, that that'll buy you that valuable time to keep right. uh, keep the fire in it in its uh, compartment of origin, and hopefully, until the engine company is ready to, to push in, or if if need be, you're, excuse me, uh, removing an adjacent door to cover up that door that's either burned through or I've had cases where there hasn't been a door on the bedroom at all. Right. So now what we have no way of, of confining that fire. So you got to make something make something wor work and you know, grabbing an adjacent door, ideally one that serves a room and not a closet because those can be smaller dimension. Smaller. They, could be uh, they could be louvered, which is going to greatly diminish your ability to include that opening. So that, that's, that's clutch. No, and 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 just the the thought exercise behind how what are you going to do in this situation, and it's awesome, man. Um, and these are the things the book brings up over and over. But uh, Rob Fisher threw a question at you. I want to read it to you, and it says, "What's uh, what's Papa's thoughts on fear mongering surrounding vertical ventilation?" On a recent post, he talked. He references Bill Carey and the line of duty deaths. And we haven't had a. It's been almost ten years since we had a vertical ventilation line of duty death where someone was actually on air doing vertical ventilation. So, what's your thoughts on it? So the the, the data just doesn't support the this fear mongering behind vertical ventilation. You know, you look at the the line of duty death reports, which Bill of uh, Bill Carey, uh, who's uh, uh, works with the uh, the fire engineering uh, group, uh, does a phenomenal job of of you know breaking down the, these. Uh, line of duty death statistics and, and really extracting the lessons learned from them and, and making sure that the the right messages are being conveyed and not ones that are are you know being fueled by agenda or trying to or being skewed to try and make somebody's point um so there, there just isn't the line of duty death reports to to uh to back that that's that fear mongering up now what, what i've uh seen and heard of a lot is um you talk about skewed data and I, from i believe where this had stemmed from was uh a perversion of uh don abbott's you know project mayday statistics about you know maydays coming from you know oper a roof operation right and i believe some of those statistics were were being skewed to promote that fear mongering um, and I know that there's, uh, you know, this is all kind of tied in with, um, I I've never sat through the blue card program myself, but from things that I've been hearing from, from other people that, 
is you know some of the things that are that are uh, kind of being tossed uh, tossed out and there, there's uh, uh, definitely uh, not a um, their their stance is not pro vertical ventilation from what I what I've been told again I don't want to speak out of turn right. for the the blue card fellows but that's been kind of what's been the, conveyed the, to me the sense that I've got I've never taken the class but the sense I get is yeah we're not getting on roofs if you're on blue card I don't know if that's true I'm with Nick so if someone knows so, better let us know. Yeah, please. If that's contrary to, to what's what's actually true, I don't want to speak. Out Rob of Fisher says blue right card now. is anti vertical ventilation. That's according okay. to Rob Fisher. There you go. Okay, so that that just is confirming you know what we had suspected. Uh, when it comes to vertical ventilation, there is absolutely a time and place. It is an effective tactic if you have the um, the, the resources to implement it. In addition to properly staffing uh, the 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 first hand line, especially, as well as prop, uh, properly conducting a, a, a primary search. So we're rapidly occupying the interior and getting to, uh, to those remote spaces as quickly as possible, which is by whatever means it is uh, um, going to be dependent on the situation. Sure. Uh, and you also have the ability to conduct vertical ventilation and it's appropriate for the situation and it's going to further um, support the tenability of that space and promote victim survivability. Absolutely. But the, the problem is for, for a lot of the fire service where they have to, you know, triage and prioritize, you know, what they're, uh, what they're able to implement for tactics, if they can conduct, you know, horizontal, uh, in a lot of cases, horizontal ventilation uh, can achieve the, the, uh, a, a similar effect um, as vertical ventilation, at least within uh, the livable, uh, the livable spaces, the main, you know, living floors. Um, as vertical ventilation, especially when it's it's supported, you know, uh, you know, po post suppression with the hydraulic ventilation, and, and um, you know, we're we're also you know coordinating uh, the, the creation of other openings with the, you know the members that are conducting the primary search as they maneuver through those remote spaces. So once we get water on the fire, one of the things that the that was you know uh, it came out in the coordinated fire attack study, and it's and it's written as such. Is that you know once you know once suppression has has taken place, you know uh, horizontal ventilation of as many openings as possible is going to have the greatest impact on uh, on victim survivability. So once we have water on the fire and the fire is in check, the more openings that that we create is mm. you know for the most part is going to uh, improve tenability. So we need to make sure that we're relieving all of the spaces within the structure that we're not just ho um, uh, homing in on uh, the intake pathway in the, in the fire room because, and that's why you know, I'm glad we led off with that discussion of, you know, vertical ventilation, even when it's, you know, over the fire room or even if it's stra uh, straddling the hallway or, or even in one of the experiments that we did with, uh, with the study was one of the vertical ventilation holes was actually placed uh, just outside the fire room itself. It was literally just outside the threshold of the door, but it was fully within the hallway. Right. Um, and even in, the, in that case, it still didn't draw out the, uh, the products of combustion out from those adjacent bedrooms that were directly off of the hallway. Without because their own the window, points. Because right. the, okay. the windows remained intact, they had uh, no way of exchanging air. There was no intake point uh, to, to create that. There's uh, nothing to pull. It's like... Yeah. Exactly. Back, to, the, no, back to shotgun and the beer. Exactly. There's no. There's no pull. So we we need to look at you know what what's feasible for uh, for us not only for the conditions that we're uh, that we're being faced with but also it, it comes down to you know what we have for for resources. So it's it's staffing. It's you know equipment, and then also within within that that staffing arena because let's be honest with ourselves here. Not all firefighters and not all crews are created equally. Uh, we, we all have varying degrees of experience and skill sets and levels of proficiency. And uh, uh, company officers and incident commanders need to be very cognizant of the limitations of their crews and their, you know, their equipment and what they can accomplish. And one of the, the things that I, that I like to, to touch on is it's, it comes down to you know, reflex time and agility. Now, I'm a... Uh, Unfortunately, I had never got. I didn't get the opportunity to you know, serve in the um, serve in the military. Um, I got hired very young in, in the fire department, but um, 
you know, I, I would have really loved to have uh, served in, in the military. And I've always had this this profound respect for uh, for all of our armed services, but particularly the Marine Corps. Um, and I've read a lot of the Marine Corps doctrinal publications. Uh, you know, if, if anybody hasn't read War Fighting, War Fighting. or um, MCDP One Tact Four, the the tactics manual, um, and even the latest one, you know, which we'll, we can talk about later on if we even get there, is uh, is the, the latest one on learning, which it's it's just incredible the parallels between. Um, the concepts of, of maneuver warfare, which was, you know, John Boyd is, uh, you know, the the unofficial godfather of maneuver right. warfare. The, yes. Um, and I'm a, a huge fan of, of loop, Boyd's, yes. and you know, the the OODA loop was, you know, the the one of the drive the two driving forces behind, you know, the uh, decision making uh, model that that I include in the book, which oh. is is the raid the raid loop that that I uh, that I created, um, but. Uh, the the point of this this uh, this this whole that that aspect is it's um I, I don't I compl- I completely lost my train of thought because we went so so no, so we went uh, in a big long circle a huge huge loop no, here hundred percent where did we leave we where did we leave off you're asking me whenever I'm saying <laughs> Amanda Miller I, I, this sums it up Amanda Miller said holy hell he's like the embodiment of a branching cascade of vent info. Going to have to watch this one a couple times to soak it all in. Dude, 100%, man. You're going to have to re-listen to this to get all the information. Um, and I apologize because we're this is like a shotgun blast of information. No, no, 100%. Like- and uh, d- welcome to the scrap. That's what it always is, and that's the best part about it, man. Um, it was on vertical ventilation and the fear-mongering. That's where we started. Now, I don't know where we ended up. So but- uh, Okay, so we, we got back to it was, it was reflex time and agility. Yes, yes. So – how long is it? We'll so get there. Vertical, I promise. We, we'll get there. Go. We we can whether you're uh, your proponent of vertical ventilation or not. I think we can all ag- agree from a, a physics and, and you know fire dynamic standpoint that vertical ventilation is you know the most efficient form of air exchange because it's a dedicated exhaust point. It's utilizing the buoyancy of the gases to to, uh, to purely you know uh, discharge the byproducts of combustion you know directly uh, above uh, the seat of the fire. I think that's we could all agree on that unequivocally. Um, but the you know the, the the key to remember is it's not necessarily what the most efficient or the best tactic is for the conditions. It's what's the best tactic that we could accomplish given our 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 resources, the resources. in the time that we have allotted to achieve the intended effect that we're aiming for. Bam. So yes, vertical ventilation by like, in theory by the book. Uh, have the would be the greatest uh, and most efficient uh, air exchange. However, I don't have the necessary resources to execute it in the time frame that I that I've been given in order to achieve the 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 um the, the effect that I'm looking for. Is it is it really the best choice? Am, it, it, am I really doing what's best for uh, for the victims? So I need to look at that re- that reflex time very carefully, and it's what can I accomplish with the time that uh, on the timeline that I've been that I've been given sure. with what I ha- or with what I'm capable of doing and the resources. So you that's have on where scene. exactly, right. and that's knowing knowing your people, knowing your equipment, and knowing your limitations. Right on. So that and and that only comes through training and and, and working together and knowing and knowing your people. Uh, so th- this just you know again lends credence back to. You know, the training and drilling aspect and why it's so critically important. So we need to understand what what we're capable of accomplishing, you know, g- uh, given our per- uh, particular set of circumstances. Thousand percent. Um, yeah, Rob Fisher agrees. He said, amen, resources and training. Number one, number one fan uh, of this scrap so far, Rob Fisher has been the number one contributor. <laughs> Amanda Miller, and I'll do my best, uh, Val Kilmer. I don't have the mustache, but my best Val Kilmer impression I said, uh, what was that? It was, uh, I stand corrected, Wyatt, you're an oak. And that's, uh, Amanda Miller said, fear-mongering behind vertical vent shares the same roots as the fear behind VEIS. Zero true understanding, zero proficiency, zero confidence, unacceptable laziness guised as fear. And I think that kind of sums it up pretty well. Yeah, and and when we're deciding between, you know, vertical ventilation versus horizontal ventilation, uh, a a lot of this has to come down to you know, looking at the fire location within the building and understanding building construction, because there's a big difference between, you know, the uh, 
a fire in you know a, a main a living area, which you know typically you look at your know, most dwellings is they're compartmentalized. There's ample you know window window openings that are available to, to horizontally vent each individual compartment. Whereas now you take it in the context of a half story, whether that's a the true attic space, which your horizontal openings are going to be limited to, it could be as little as a, a, a tiny little, you know, ga uh, gable louver vent on, on either end of, of, uh, of the gables, the, on the gable sides of the roof, which, you know, when you look at some of those vents are, are you know, a couple, a couple inches uh, wide. So it isn't going to provide you with much ventilation at all, or they, they're, you may even have, you know, gable and windows, even in some attic attic spaces, they may be smaller in size, but you know you do have some openings. Right. Now, the thing to remember about the uh, also about the attic spaces is those are uncompartmentalized spaces. So once the fire either if the fire starts in the attic or communicates to the attic, it's off to the races because now the fire is uninhibited. It can right. you know spread right. laterally. It's got um, you know a, a much more abundant you know supply of of air readily available to it because it's not you know compartmentalized by, oh. by the, the, the wall sections and those, you know, door openings are often those choke points, those limiting factors of, of that airflow within the fire and what's available to the fire. Um, so the you know, attic spaces are an entirely different animal. So, uh, and because of the, the limited horizontal openings, that's where vertical ventilation is going to have a, a, a higher return on investment. And it also in the the finished half story spaces, even more so because the knee wall. now because of the knee wall right. spaces. So those rafters are you know that are uh, that uh, that are on the angle. The knee wall, uh, the knee wall studs are, are attached to the the under the underside of those roof rafters. All right. So now we have these large uh, the, these large open you know, void spaces that can go from one end of the, of the building to the other. And it's a tremendous volume of space that can conceal a large volume of fire, can build up a tremendous amount of pressure. And even if that, that living space is dormered or we have large gable end windows, if we vent those windows, it's only going to vent the living space. It does nothing to ventilate the void spaces. Right, right. So that's something to keep into consideration as well, because uh, uh, fires in, in knee walls are, are some of the most tumult like, tumultuous and, in, in, oh, uh, yeah. you know, potentially violent Where's fires all this that heat we coming respond from, to. Man, it's like when you're caught because up in it. Yeah. If, if those, that, that fire is building within that void space and it's unbeknownst to us, once they do break out, whether yeah. it's, it starts to fail the, the, the wall sheathing or we create those openings, um, if we're not ready for it, that fire can break out with with with, an, uh, with a vengeance. Yeah, the rapid fire development, of, like like the definition of rapid fire development. Absolutely, because yeah. essentially it's that shotgun blast of of pressure that's being built up and is being you know you know fun, you know funneled out a, a small hole. And you know I've been you know uh, on the receiving end of that where you you've gone from you know, conditions that you you know you were essentially standing up in to. You know that, that fire breaches the, those uh, void spaces, and now you, you know you're getting put uh, smushed down to the ground, and fire's rolling over your head in a matter of seconds. Dude. So th that's where it, it's that vertical ventilation is going to be so impactful because now we have the ability to relieve that mounting pressure within those void spaces and, and channel it out, and you know reduce that lateral fire spread by giving it a, 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 an avenue up and out to to uh, prevent it from you know you know mushrooming down and building up that pressure and if recognized you know, uh, and if coordinated, a hundred percent. Absolutely, that's it, man. And this is and and, and Nick Esposito is going to love this because we we've talked about this before and we're complete in, in complete agreement. Uh, there's a uh, two schools of thought about the placement of the ventilation hole when it comes to venting knee walls. Uh, there's some folks that believe that you, you should be venting directly over the knee walls, which okay. would situate that that hole lower in um, in the roof section. Right. But again, going back to the way that the, the they're framed out. Because the the studs are the uh, fastened to the underside, the knee wall void space is interconnected to the rafter bays, which is also interconnected to that, for lack of a better term, that that ceiling void or the plenum space, if, if you will, uh, above the ceiling. They're all interconnected. So if, as long as we choose the right side of the uh, 
uh, the pitch of the roof. So we're on the involved knee wall side. If we start up by the ridge pole, we vent at the highest point. Now we're not, we're going to capture all three of those voids. You're going to capture that ceiling void. You're going to capture the, the rafter base. You're going to capture the, the knee wall space. And here's the other aspect of it too. It's what, you know, if you're venting off of a, a, uh, like a platform or an aerial device and you know, you've got that stable platform to, to work off of, that's one thing. But if we're operating off of a roof ladder, which is going to be typically the case because in these half, the, these livable half stories, it's going to be a steeper pitch to, to create right. that room, to create in, room in order for that living space to exist. So it's going to be, um, uh, yeah, largely be point. a steeper yeah. pitch. So if you're operating off of a roof ladder, there's only so far you can extend your reach out, especially, you know, uh, for those of us who are, you know, are on the, uh, uh, are not as tall, you know, our reach isn't as long. So you may only be able to roll one rafter. And if that's the case, if you only roll one rafter and you don't extend your cut down lower, you're, you're shortchanging yourself. You're, it, you're not going to get the same square footage as you would if you did that two, uh, that at least two rafter roll. So now by starting at the peak, I now have all of that that uh, real estate going down the roof peak to now expand that cut downward. Oh, nice. Which will, make, up for, make up for the horizontal will, with the exactly. vertical. Exactly. Okay, okay. Exactly. Okay. So Beautiful. now I'm extending my cut nice. down because of my inability to reach out and, and, um, and make the cut wider. So now I can uh, I have that ability to extend down. Which yes is going to more directly vent above that that uh, that knee wall that knee wall space if I do have to get that go low. that low right beautiful so to me it, it gives it gives you the that freedom and flexibility to go go down lower if you need to and Nick is still in here because he says and we're back to a base and I love this this is this is like encapsulate this whole thing because and we're back to a basic <laughs> understanding of building construction and fire behavior man. Yeah. Uh, and Nick, and Nick, and Nick's, Nick's a gr- uh, great friend and uh, okay. you know, somebody, somebody who, uh, uh, who I, I value greatly. So uh, it's, it's awesome to have him on the scrap here tonight. Thousand percent. And so, dude. And, I, also, I, and also somebody who you should have on as a guest. And as a shameless okay. plug for uh, my buddy Nick. He's a, a wealth, wealth of knowledge. Nick's the a captain on uh, uh, Bridgeport's Heavy Rescue Company. And he also runs the uh, the Truck Tactics page as a shameless plug dude. for for, uh, for Nick's I am always looking for guests that people suggest as worthy, uh, passionate people. So, uh, and that'd be a great conversation too, because, uh, um, Nick, uh, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I got to work with some of those individuals that, um, either were in that pre SCBA era themselves or worked with individuals who were pre SCBA. And, you know, so you're um, saying he's pretty seasoned. Uh, did, did Nick, Nick is a, a very experienced fire, fire, <laughs> fair, fair so, enough. very experienced. Yeah, he's, Nick's got a lot of trigger time. So he, you know, he, he'd be able to, you know, further that conversation to talk on, you know, the, the traditions and, you know, uh, of where our tactics have co- come from and why we do what we do. So that, that would be a tremendous conversation among the many other topics that, that Nick's, uh, well-versed in and speaks, uh, uh very well about. And Rob Fisher uh, seconded Papa's recommendation. So, if we were in a meeting with a gavel, it would be a first and a motion and a second, all in favor. So, Nick, look for me to reach out for you. The book is Coordinating Ventilation by Nick Papa. Nicholas Papa, Fire Engineering, available. Uh, you can also get it in Kindle form, I'm very aware. And the uh, he said, I'm old, but not that old. That's from Nick. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't say you were old, brother. <laughs> seasoned. We use the word seasoned. So, um, all that being said, I want to say this. With all of this conversation, and we're at we're at ninety minutes at the moment, we barely scratched the surface of the book. I, I cannot say that enough. It's like we there is you have to. I don't. I try not to gush about a book this much, but it, you have to get this book if you were serious about. Um, Rob touched on it. Everybody touched on it. Building construction fire behavior. This book is uh, what it's about. It's not just tactics. It is the why. It scratches that itch of the nerd okay now quit talking about it nicholas you wrote a banger of a book that's what i'll say so besides this besides this one i always ask is there a book or books that you think firefighters should be reading and with as many sightings as was (laughs) as many so i'm expecting go ahead uh, so the, one of them that we, we touched on already, it was uh, James Braidwood, and it's, uh, if I can get this right, 
It's on the construction of fire engines uh, and apparatus, the training of firemen and, and method of proceeding is, in is case there, of fire. Is there a, can you actually get a copy of that, or is there like the PDF you can. or something? Yeah, they, uh, they, there's one of those uh, those publishing uh, okay. uh, houses that actually reprinted the book. Nice. Um, but so there, there's two of them. Uh, one, uh, the one that I listed, the on the construction of fire engines, was that published one published from 1830. The other one that was was published in 1866 which was on fire prevention and extinction. Uh, there's, it's almost like a, a, a reprinting of that first volume with okay. the addition of, of some, uh, some other you know, topics as well. Um, but that, that first text that from the 1830 text, that's the one that, that you see that the, fir the first writings that I'm aware about of, of, of flow path, which, was, which he referred to as the draft, um, the you know, early talks of you know, door, I love the door draft, control. I really love that. Yeah, it's again. This is it's just the you know, the, the rebranding of of, of term of terminology. terminology. And I love it. It's yeah, you know. It, so, that, but it's this is you know uh, where I I I thank uh, Aaron so much for you know just kind of o opening that door for me uh, of you know where he has that that famous line is if you you know if you think you're new or original you haven't looked at the history enough. Right on. And how he ch he challenges folks to to go back and, and, and look at the history books to see, you know, uh, what our predecessors were doing and, and why they did, why they did, they did the things that we did and, you know, how that evolution process has taken place, you know, because that will leads to, you know, where we are today and, and, and why we do things. And it's uh, it's really important that we, we study our past because it's that, that old adage, if we don't learn from the past that we're just, doomed. you know, doomed to re doomed to repeat it. So that, that, uh, that would be my um, my suggested fire service, you know, or t you know, strategic and tactical text. Okay. Um, I don't want to repeat any other text, but there's so you know so many that have already been mentioned. You know, anything by Vinnie Dunn, you know, Manuel Fried's Love book, it. which is Im impossible to find. Right. So good luck with that one. Um, but as and far to brag as about other, it if you get it. You gotta oh, brag. Yeah. About it. You gotta you do the humble brag, like yeah. look what I found. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So Emmanuel Fried's book, you know, Mike Turpex size up book. Those are all, these have all been been brought up. So, you know, the, uh, I, I second second third all all those those motions are ready. Uh, but I, Cor, uh, Corley, I know you're you're a big uh, you know leadership uh, uh, absolutely you know st leadership student, and you, you do a lot of reading. Uh, and I wanted to stick to uh, book recommendations that weren't touched on already. So, if anybody listens to the Jocko he's the you obviously know you've heard the name Colonel David Hackworth oh yeah so H Hackworth was basically Jocko's you know uh, mentor from afar um, who basically it was his writings that inspired Jocko to write you know his laws of combat that are the basis of nice. his extreme ownership so the book uh, uh, Colonel Hackworth has a, a bunch of different books out he's a, a very accomplished writer but the one that resonated with me the most is actually not the one that Jocko okay. uh, uh, endorses all the time, which is uh, about face. About face, right? The one that that one that resonated with me the most was called "Steal Steal My Soldiers' Hearts." Now, for anybody that is a company officer or aspires to be a company officer, that should be required reading. Period. Mm. Period. You want to talk about? Because um, I, I don't I don't care how bad your situation is. Your situation is nowhere. It pales in comparison to what Colonel Hackworth experienced when he took over an infantry infantry regiment in uh, in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Um, he literally had every obstacle thrown at him imaginable, and he took over a, a ragtag um, regiment that had zero discipline and you know almost absent combat effectiveness, and turned them into the most high performing um, outfit. Uh, in the entire theater, um, so their numbers uh, were were unparalleled, and this this came from a group that at one point had uh, there was reports that there was a, a bounty on uh, on Colonel Hackworth's head at one point, nice. you know, from his own guys. Um, but he took it went from from one extreme to the other, where the guy his guys would would take a bullet for him without question, and it just goes from everything about in you know setting expectations and instilling discipline and he really uh it's it's very similar to uh rob fisher's uh you know 10 pounds of pressure 100 percent of the time where nice. he had this rule of 
you know, no more than two changes at a time. And it, it were, uh, you know, like uh, Aaron Fields uses the, the fix like a funnel model. Right. It's that similar concept is what what needs to what's the most priority thing that needs to be addressed right now. And we're going to address no more than two of them at a time. And then once we address those, now we go on to the next thing and the next thing. So that's incremental changes. So you're not bombarding, uh, you know, your troops with, you know, all of these changes, especially if you're new to the the firehouse or new to the crew or a new company officer. But it just goes through, you know, building morale, you know, uh, esprit de corps nice. and, you know, the uh, that uh, that mission oriented mindset and um, it, it just the, the pr- uh, good, practical, hard training. I can't speak about it enough. Now, uh, going even further back along the line, Colonel Hackworth's mentor from afar was uh, General Bruce Clark. And this is another book that was up until Jocko, you know, uh, pushed the envelope and, and basically forced the publisher's hand to reprint the book was it took Jocko over 10 years to find uh, an original copy, wow. which I'm lucky. I, I was lucky enough to score one nice. right before they, they uh, got reprinted. Uh, but it's, it's the guidelines for the leader and commander by General Bruce Clark. And that is a, is a very short read. Um, and it, it's just really, you know, the brass tacks of, of you know, leadership. And just, it's a, a, a just a nugget mine full, uh, full of all of these, you know, these practical um, tips and, and strategies of, of, how, of how to uh, go about, you know, you know leading it's it's just it's tremendous, and that nice. was the basis for you know, all of Hackworth's uh, philosophies and his writings. And it's reprinted uh, now. Yeah, so much it's it's reprint it's reprinted now, and instead of you having to spend upwards of a couple hundred dollars and scouring eBay and all you know all those other book outlets and hoping you score one, you can now go on Amazon or yeah, uh, and, and score one for I think it's like ten dollars. Next can get day one delivery it, type so. deal, right? And if you're not a, a big reader, this is a, a great book. To start with because it's a it's a short easy read okay um and the pair and the parallels to the fire service are 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 very clear and apparent there's no reading between the lines to to um to get you know get, uh, to mine those nuggets they're they're right in the forefront um another uh, the w- one last one that i'll touch on Go is uh, Dude, you're killing it because you did your research because so far not a single one of these has ever been suggested well, before. I, I, I made it a challenge. Okay. This is a challenge to me. To, I like uh, it. The know, OCD I'm kicked in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> it was funny. It was funny too because it was was uh, this was a challenge too because I wanted my my answers to be as original as possible, which is 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 getting increasingly difficult since you're now on number one hundred and nine. Yes, sir. And yeah. uh, especially when it came to me prepping for the five questions because. Uh, um, it, it, it was like Steve Robertson had. Uh, we, we, it was like reading from the like the notes that I had scribbled down, um, which is, I, I, I lo- love Steve dearly. I think Absolutely. he's uh, a tr- tremendous individual, and uh, so I, I greatly enjoyed his scrap. So I'm going to try and you know pull on some similar threads, uh, but but be you know take a more uh, a more sure. uh, a, a different approach so we can give some original content to the, the listeners. But I like it. Um, your uh, last podcast uh, uh, guest, Dane, uh, Dane Yaw, was it? Yes, yeah. Yeah, Dane. he uh, brought up Gary Klein. Now, he talked about the book Sources of Power. Uh, my personal favorite from Gary Klein is The Power of Intuition. Okay. Uh, now, when I started reading this book, I had no idea that uh, Gary Klein had done research on firefighters when he de- Wait, uh, when okay. he was de- developing the recognized prime decision-making model and that uh, concept of naturalistic decision-making. So as soon as I started reading, I opened it up and I go, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This guy actually researched firefighters right. and incident commanders and why they why they did what they did and how they arrived at their decisions. And how and they didn't understand. Just, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. It's just an incre- incredible, uh, incredible book and really goes into uh, – it, it's a great o- opener into you know how we make decisions and it was a, a, a basis for – how I came up with that human factors section of the book and, you know, uh, develop those, those, you know, four, uh, those four human uh, behaviors that were, were, le- were leading to um, uh, ventilation being uh, improperly timed or, right. you know, improperly uh, executed. So that was a big f- uh, factor of that. And just it, giving you a better understanding of how your brain works. It, it's, it's just a tremendous read. And I don't, I, 
I'm trying. I, I, it's very Dude. hard right now for me to dive into this, but I don't want to go down a separate. That's a whole other. Podcast okay. 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 Itself. No, no. And I, I, I get that completely. Um, like, I feel like we're scratching surfaces and like opening, opening these little veins. And it's like, we could go like two hours that way or two hours that way. So, exactly. No, a hundred percent. man. I exactly. love it. And, and the thing I love the most is like steal my soldier's hearts. I've heard it because I listen to Jocko. You know, I, I go through spurts where I listen to quite a few and mm-hmm. then I, then I lay off Same and here. To fire. Yeah. I can handle so much and then I have to take a break and I come back, but I've heard him mention it, but I've never read the book. So now after you, after you saying that, there's no doubt I'm getting that book. I'm going to read it. So thank you for that. Yeah. And these other it, two. It, yeah, absolutely. To me, to me, that should be a mandatory read on any promotional exam process or any, you know, officer, officer development program, because it, it, it you want to talk about authentic leadership and, and, you know, leading sustainably and not in, you know, leading from the heart and not just doing these, these, you know, uh, you know, surface, you know, vin- you know, veneer, you know, veneer acts or, you know, short, these short term, um, you know, interventions, this is, you know, authentic leadership at, at its finest. All right. I love it. Now we're getting to the point, but before we get to the point, it's happened three times in the history of the scrap. I am going to hit the head before we do the five questions for firefighters. Cause we're pushing one hour and 40 minutes and I've had a few of my Modelo favorites. <laughs> so the scrap, I, this is how much trust I have in you. I met you today for the first time. And you get complete control of the live show. So just talk. All right. So uh, I wish I had con- control over the board. Let me see if I can pull up uh, uh, the, the Facebook feed here um, to see if I can find out if anybody's got any comments or questions to, uh, to touch on. All right. Since I can't do that in a timely fashion, I don't. I don't want to have the, the awkward silence. So, in going along the, those the, the, that those the lines of the uh, recognized prime decision making and Gary Klein's work for anybody that that's interested, uh, it, it really whether you're interested in in the neuroscience or, or or not, it's really important for us to understand how we make decisions, especially under stress, because when we look at the fire ground, it's there's a high level of uncertainty. It's a time contra- uh, time compressed environment uh, where there's uh, high levels of, of stress because we're operating in this very uh, acute environment. So this is why uh, developing a, a high level of, of knowledge and in, in, in developing true understanding and the more proficient that we the more competent and proficient that we come, the less mental bandwidth, if you will, that we're going to utilize and the, the more ingrained and innate we can, you know, we can make these processes, um, the, the more we're going to, the more headspace we're going to have freed up to be able to, to size up more, more keenly and to be able to pick up more subtle details and allow us to, uh, arrive at decisions more rapidly. So, uh, the, the better, the more knowledgeable we are, the greater our level of our under, understanding that we have, the more competent that become, the more proficient that we are in executing our skill sets. And we are able to predict, you know, how the, those tactics are going to interact with the fire ground. Um, the, the more naturally we're going to um, be able to uh, arrive at these decisions and, and execute the tactics that we need to, to properly intervene. So that, that's it, it's that slide. It's the slides in the slide tray con, uh, concept, that, which is really the kind of the basis behind recognized prime decision making. It's the the deeper your level of understanding and the more uh, uh, genuine experience that you have, uh, the more slides that you're going to have in the slide tray. And the basis behind recognized prime decision making is it's it's pattern matching. It's being able to um, instinctively, you know, you're this is all happening more or less at a subconscious level is within that that slide tree that is your brain it's trying to find a slide that matches the pattern of what your your eyes is, are, are seeing and what the other sensory inputs that you're taking in and your your brain is trying to find a pattern that that closely matches or matches the scenario that you're facing so you can more that, that's where that intuitive uh, decision making comes into play because the the more ornate this uh and ingrained this material is the quicker, uh, the more slides you're going to have, and the quicker that you're going to uh, match those patterns and be able to arrive at those uh, those decisions. And that's that 
you know, where where Klein would would interview these these uh, fire ground commanders afterwards and say, well, how did you know to do that, or how did you arrive at that decision? He's like, well, I didn't have time to act. We, we or to think, we just acted. Like this right. is what we do. But in peeling that onion back and really, you know, um, you know, teasing out the the, the information from the, uh, these incident commanders through conversations and dialogue. It, come to find out it's through their experience they were able to say well you know i know that in in these situations that you know x y and z is the case so and that's that subconscious you know pattern matching that's occurring within within our brains and that's what you know i'm i'm hoping to to help individuals connect the dots and you know just like you know captain cirillo had said like you know he he was uh operating as a conduit of information to, to pass on to the fire service. That's what I'm hoping that this, this, this book is going to, is going to be for the fire service is it's not, you know, me tr uh, trying to profess myself as a subject matter expert or, you know, try, uh, or, or what have you, this is, uh, me simply trying to, you know, consolidate and collate all of this information that I've extracted from over a hundred different sources, um, from firsthand experiences through vicarious experiences and, you know, t you know, in intertwining that information 100%. and, you know, you know, we've weave weaving the weaving these th these threads together. So that way that uh, that anybody can pick up the book and very simply, you know, connect these dots and make these connections um, in a in a very you know simple and efficient manner instead of having to, you know, invest thousands <laughs> that, of man yeah, hours, in, hours into doing this. So that's. You know that that's what I'm hoping is, uh, you know, my con you know contribution to the fire service is if I can, you know, make this information more accessible and more digestible for the the everyday street level firefighter or you know you know street level you know uh, officer, then you know that's to to me that that's all that's that's all all I need in return and it, it makes it makes that that investment you know worth it. Absolutely, man. I love it. Uh, Matthew Bilt said, are you doing any seminars around Connecticut in the future? So much awesome info on here tonight. Amanda Miller said, or Tennessee, this man needs multiple directed <laughs> interviews, must harvest knowledge. And that's the way it was written out. So, um, and that's the thing I sit here and listen to you talk, uh, and I can just get out of the way. I should, I should do that more often with my guests. <laughs> Thanks for a better scrap. No, no, they... No, it was. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, you know, the you know you tossing up the softballs to to knock out of the park here. You know, hopefully, and it, it's the the hard part is 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 not going too deep in one particular rabbit hole because as you said, we're just scratching the surface on some very deep topics here, and I'm I'm trying to you know touch on enough of them to at, at least uh, you know wet people's beaks a little bit and, nice. and give them a little taste to you know. Um, at least touch, touch on the topic enough to to satisfy what what people may have have you know tuned in tonight for or tuning in at a later date to to maybe have a question answered or or you know have a little bit more clear uh, clarity and light shed on a uh, on a particular topic. Absolutely. So, five questions for firefighters. We do it on the weekly scrap every time. The uh, the questions are the same. The points are completely arbitrary. The answers are yours and yours alone, and they're your opinions. So. Nick Papa, are you ready for the five questions for firefighters? I'm ready. Let's do this. Here we go. And I like it because I know there was prep time, <laughs> so I really like this. What is the number one issue facing the modern fire service? It, 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 this is going to be a, a multifaceted answer, but it I all like stems it. from it's, it's information saturation and relevancy. So the one of the things that 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 I think is is profound is uh, Elkhart Brass had had made that that uh, that drowning that said, you know we're you know we're we're you know drowning for uh, we're drowning in information but we're starving for wisdom, and that's that difference between you know knowledge versus understanding, you know because of uh, this is the the double edged sword of you know social media and you know the the ubiquity of information and how you know. Really, we can share uh, share information, and you know it, now we can we're reprinting texts that were you know out of print and previously unavailable. Um, so we have this this wealth of knowledge that you know that the well of information is is so deep we can't see the uh, that you can't see the bottom of it. So the problem is is it's it's sifting through all of that information to determine not only what's credible because it's it, with with the internet it's gotten harder to to vet the information so right. making sure that you're 
um, your information is coming from, you know, reput reputable sources where uh, the, the citations are listed as well, because, you know, anybody that's um, that's speaking on a particular uh, subject, especially if they're, you know, taking a certain stance or especially if they're, they're you know, uh, giving, you know, tactical considerations or, or endor endorsing certain topic or tactics, you better be citing your sources and, and backing up what, what you're saying with either, you know, first, uh, firsthand experience, but, but also with, uh, with data. So you need to have, you know, some, some figures to, to back it up with. Um, and so this, this becomes the problem is now, we're because it's so easy to get bogged down and saturated with all, with all of this information. It's hard to to sift out and distill down what's practical to to us and our and our particular organizations, because as we alluded to earlier, firefighting you know is is regional. It's okay. jurisdictionally driven based off of our our building stock and what our, our resources are and, and what we're capable of accomplishing. So so that's key. Is you you gotta you have to you have to be that filter. And have to to figure that out, and especially when it comes to tactics and, and equipment, you got to do your own you know research and uh, research and development and test things out for yourselves. Just because it works in one particular jurisdiction doesn't mean it's going to necessarily work for you or be applicable for you. So that's key. Now with this this in, this information black hole, this is now uh, where I'm kind of going to take that that the other half of this equation here, which is. For those of us that are tuning in here, that are that are as as Joey D would say, yeah, into the job. Uh -huh. All right, this can become a black hole for us. You know, I've I've been guilty of it many times over. That my wife can certainly uh, attest to is just getting sucked into, you know, chasing down these rabbit holes because you get sucked into, you know, you're know, pulling on these threads and looking at this information, whether it's online, in text, or or you know going to the different the different conferences. And yes, uh, I'm, I'm never gonna tell somebody to, to, to not seek that education and that training, um, but it's gotta be tempered. We have to maintain that proper work-life balance. And, mm. and that's that's essential for for if, for if for us and our, our general well-being. And that that transcends the, you know, the firehouse and home. And, um, it, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to, to, to call Aaron Fields a, 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 a close friend. And, you know, he's somebody that that is a mentor to not only uh, to me, not only in the fire service, but also um, in, in life. I mean, when when I have some tough parenting questions and uh, um, he's one of the, the, the handful of people that that is uh, that, I, that I call when I, when I need that advice. And um, when I was taking when I was taking nozzle forward again in, in Jersey, I, I had the opportunity to sit down and just have a, a totally, you know, um, you know, real conversation. It was just the two of us, you know, talking about, you know, family. And um, he kind of he also ended the lecture with this, which I, I think is is just really lends to, to his character and, and when what he's all about is he talked about, you know, the importance of prioritizing everything that we do in life and how you know, everything today seems to be, you know, about efficiency and trying to, you know, multitask and, 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 you know, get the best bang for our buck. And the problem is, is that we need to be all in with whatever, whatever it is that we're doing. And we need to, you know, prioritize and budget our time accordingly. And the way he put it bluntly was he's like, when, when I'm at the firehouse, I'm all in and I'm at the firehouse. But when I'm at home, I'm all in and I'm home. Mm. I, I'm, I'm focused on nothing but family. Or when I'm at the firehouse, I'm focused on the mission. You know, so he, he, he's like, you can't have it both ways. He's like, because you're going to inevitably shortchange uh, one, one or the other, other if you try, if you try and because this whole concept of multitasking is a fallacy. You, you're it, there. It's, there's no such thing because you can't do either one of them effectively and efficiently. One of one of them, uh, one area that that you're trying to balance is always going to get shortchanged. So I think that's just key for us uh, for us all to take in. And this is targeted at at the audience of of the scrap because these are the folks that are that are ate up about the job. And that, that's often one of the hardest things for us to balance um, is maintaining that that healthy work life balance. And you know, often for for us, our the fire service can become a pseudo hobby. Um, in, in more or less, but I think it's it's critically important for us to have have hobbies and activities outside the fire service. And I know uh, you're a, a fellow you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu player as well. So um, for me, players a stretch, but yeah, 
<laughs> uh, that's uh, for me. That's been my uh, my outlet, and it, it, it it's crazy that the amount of parallels that there are. Oh yeah. And, um, now and having done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the last couple of years, you now can, can make all the connections and, and see where Aaron developed a lot of these uh, handline oh, yeah. uh, techniques from. Because it's that's where all the body mechanics and the leverage and you know it. it now, that's how important where it all, is marrying like, that knee to your elbow? You know what I'm saying? How important is that? In so many things, but yes. But uh, yeah, and so uh, one of one of my coaches at the gym is a corrections officer. So you know we share the you know the, the public safety domain, and he talks about this a lot. And he actually calls jujitsu mat, mat therapy. Nice. So and for me that it's it's there's so much truth to that because I like so many others have, have a busy mind where it's like, you have that shark brain. It mm -hmm. just has to be in constant motion in order for us to, oh, to yeah. maintain that homeostasis. Um, but it, it's jujitsu has taught me to, uh, to be more present in the moment because as my coach it got, went on to say is you have to be present in the moment because if your mind is elsewhere, then on the mat, oh, you're, about to be you're going to get choked out. <laughs> you're going to get choked out. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be my PSA to the, um, uh, firehouse vigilant, uh, community and, uh, is to, you know, maintain that, that work life balance. And when you're at the firehouse, be at the firehouse, when you're at home, be at home. I love that. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to springboard off you for just a second and speak because I mean, obviously there's 109 scraps and I think there's been about, we're in the nineties on, on, uh, the five questions because they didn't start at the beginning. So we're in the nineties, 90 times it was been answered and it's really hard to come up with an original and there's lots of low hanging fruit, like training and information and tech, you know, you know, all these different things and social media. And so, and one that's not very popular would be maintain a work-life balance, especially amongst the people that listen to the scrap because it, they're, you know, uh, dude, that, that is a, a highly relevant and highly um needed uh discussion so i really want to say thank you and that's max points on question one for what that's worth because they're arbitrary so number two what is the thing you are most excited about for the future of firefighting <laughs> so it, this is going to seem almost uh contradictory but okay it's I it's like it already. It, it, it's it's the refinement of the research in, in the data that's being collected. So as the, the, the studies through, through ULFSRI continue to evolve and piggyback on the, the previous studies that were done, and as technology advances and um, we're getting more accurate in, um, in wider swaths of, of, of data, uh, data sets, especially as it pertains to victim survivability, um, it's going to allow us to make better decisions and, under, and have a deeper level of understanding. And especially, you know, talking about data collection to, to speak on, and I know that, it, that so many people on, the, on, the, on the, the scrap have brought this up already, but I can't speak about enough what the, the, yes. the work that the Firefighter Rescue Survey has been doing. And, and you know, now what uh, Brian Brushes has incorporated with his graduate work is quantifying our, our grabs because that's the the major flaw with the American Fire Service Counting is our, 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 yes. our data collection is we only focus on on our on the losses of you know the the casualties and the dollar amount uh, lost in property, and that does nothing for us. And and I hate to admit admit this, but where the the law enforcement community blows us away by and large is with with data collection. They they are able to to mine their data and extrapolate data. To make any, uh, any uh, to prove any point that they they have as far as um, you know initiatives or or resource allocation, and this is why the law enforcement community is so, so much uh, more readily able to access federal funding in in different uh, grant avenues because uh, what I what I'm learning vicariously through through some of uh, you know my friends and colleagues is that you know, being awarded these grants comes down to, comes down to data, being able to prove your need. Yes. And if you don't have the data sets to do that, yes. and especially as you know, uh, we, we get f uh, further and further into um, economic uncertainty, uh, it's every community is, is, is pinching pennies and, and the bean counters are closely watching um, every dollar that's being spent. And if we're looking to, to, not only save what we have, but 
if we're advocating for inc- increased resources, you better have that da- uh, that data to back it up because when you go to that that council meeting, um, that's what the politicians are going to be looking for. Where's your proof? Right. Because they don't uh, they don't understand what it's what it's like to 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 be on the end of that hose line or to be searching that floor that floor above the fire. You know, so we we need to to connect those dots for them. And paint that picture is, is through the data sets. No, and on the city's so, line line budget item, we're just a big red negative. I mean, that's all we are. We don't generate. Very rarely do we generate any sort of income. Sorry. Got absolutely. Me talk, you got me talking. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> and it's and it's also it, 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 with the firefighter rescue survey, it's providing us with uh, with the the metrics for the uh, the effectiveness of, of our of our tactics and in, in the implementation uh, you know of them. So when you look at where they're where they're finding uh, victims and through you know what what means is having the the highest uh, you know uh, the highest survival rates and you know all of these different uh, variables and factors and and they're only going to enhance our level of understanding be able to refine our our techniques and uh, in you know streamline our decision making process so because the, the the better the better and deeper we understand these concepts the the, uh, the more sound our decision making is going to be and you know that that also kind of you know it helps us to be more directed in our our education and our drilling as well right because now we can be more focused and you know take that more that more systematic and uh you know pragmatic approach which is you know that's what i'm i'm excited uh, excited about with the fire service too is um you know taking that that more you know sport approach or um you know, that's that skill acquisition model of, of, tr- of training and drilling and taking what the military and the sports industry has has done for squ- skill acquisition and, and bringing that into the fire service arena. So I think that that's huge. And, you know, the getting away from that, the, those those excuses and that mindset of, you know, I've done that before right. or we'll figure right. we'll figure it out when we when get we there. get there. No, 100 percent. And I want to say this about about. Uh, firefighter rescue survey and the five questions for firefighters bar none i think that the data that they are collecting and brian brush's work and his doctorate it might be the most important thing and we'll be citing it 30 years from now um and it will be impacting the way that america burning impacted us back in the 70s and bottom line is any like it's not about originality and these answers is about authenticity and so dude you crushed that answer 100 percent max point so number three i want to say if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you might be one of my favorite lines of all time in a poem by rudyard kipling's if because someone mentioned rudyard kipling's if in the in the uh the scrap so i wanted to say that i had to give a shout out to rudyard kipling so back to the five questions and nick Best rank or position to be in in the fire service? Without a doubt, the company officer. And I love it. It's regardless of of your department circumstances, because I I, I know that you know in, in hearing some of the comments uh, that you know that are questions that have been brought up on the scrap and you know some of the the conversations that are had in in the discussion group is that you know a, a common question, especially when it comes to culture and in leadership, is you know, uh, overcoming adversity or, you know, maybe that, you know, your department doesn't support certain initiatives or isn't, you know, focused on, on quality training and drilling and, um, doesn't, you know, foster that, uh, that, gro- that growth mindset and environment that we're, that we're all at after. But even in the, in the worst set of circumstances, as a company officer, you can chart your own destiny at the company level. And, to me, there, there's no one has the greatest impact on on the day to day well-being of a firefighter than their company officer, mm. bar none. Bar none. And that and that transcends the fire ground, and it's it's more so into the firehouse yes. because where you make your bones as a company officer, uh, the vast majority of the time is in the firehouse. There it is. You know, it's it's you have a delicate balance of trying to to best of your people and also you know managing their idiosyncrasies and managing the, the, their shortcomings <laughs> yes. which we all have oh yeah um i'm the king so that of way we're, we're 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 setting we're putting each putting them in position so so that they succeed and we we uh we're empowering we're empowering them to utilize those those talents and those strengths 
um, while covering each other's blind spots and, and uh, minimizing their uh, their weaknesses. So that's that's the, the, the key there. And to me, it, if you go in there with with that mindset and you inst- instill that that mission, that mission oriented uh, approach and that they know unequivocally that you're there for them and for the mission. Right on. And, and that's going to take time oh, yeah. um, because they they don't want it. Hear you say it. They they want to. They they, they need to see it in your actions. So it's it's not just it can't be just be empty words and catchphrases. They have to see it in your actions. Um, so I think with that in mind and just you know t- taking those small incremental changes, especially if you're new to an assignment or new as a company officer, um, you can have that change. And it's it's just having that 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 maintaining that positivity and even despite you know uh, the what negativity may be lurking around in your fire service as a whole you can still within the, those four walls of your firehouse and you know even individually within your own uh, it, within your own crew um like i said you can you can chart your own path and, and have that that positive effect and i will go even further by saying the engine company officer is uh the the best uh, the best rank oh. uh my my uh my chief said uh said it best is he made the the parallel between an engine company officer and, and a quarterback because he said uh the engine company officer is typically the first one to arrive on scene and they're uh they essentially call the play for the uh, for the fire ground so it's their initial actions which deter you know uh, determine the, right. the the trajectory of the the entire incident Nice. So to me, that that's tops. Is there's there's nothing like arriving on scene, giving that first on scene report, and you are calling you're calling the so, uh, shots and setting that, that incident in motion, and it's your actions that determine the the overall success or failure of that operation. I love that because uh, in my department we don't have a truck dedicated truck company, so all we have is the first. Unit. So for you to make that distinction really does set it apart, and I really like that. But of course, anybody who knows me knows company officer is the greatest job to have in the fire service. So, without a doubt, three for three. Um, no pressure. Number four, best advice you have ever received. So this ties into the, the the question previously, which is to it's focus on what you can control. So wh- whatever the, that, depending on what rank you may be in, it, it, your your sphere of influence, you know, is obviously going to grow uh, exponentially with rank. But even if you're uh, a tailboard firefighter, you still have influence, you know, from uh, from that back step. And it's it's taking that that consistent approach and, and you know, making sure that you realize and, and this you know, may be a little corny, but it's even the, the smallest pebbles make ripples. Yes, those mi- r- ripples may start out small, but over time they stretch across the water. And when you think about that in, in relation to the fire service and, you know, impacting change and having any kind of real change uh, or, or, you know, cha- or developing culture uh, is going to take time. And it's just being consistent and making sure that your, your message is clear and your intentions are clear and they're, they're centered on the, uh, on the mission first and then, you know, uh, th- those of you, uh, th- those that you work with you know, uh, together in support of that mission. So I-, I think by you just worrying about your own little corner of the world and, and your sphere of influence, it, you know, it, that's going to be mostly it, within the firehouse at first. Over time, it's going to start to transcend into the fire ground, especially for those company officers that are able to um, you know, develop their, uh, their daily company level training and is able to kind of um, develop that that individual culture and that uh, that that operational tempo um, for that company. Over time, that's going to start to to you know show on the fire ground. And the the way I look at this is, eventually, you're going to if you're a company officer and this is if you're eight up into the job and this is the way that you go about doing business, you're going to attract the right people and you're going to attract those of uh those of whom that that are, are not interested 
Um, so you're it's you're going to gravitate towards the the right people. Over time, you'll you'll you may, may even because we we all don't have the the luxury of, of of choosing choosing our crews and but this is where you know authentic, authenticity and you know placing the mission and people first uh, is going to pay dividends because even somebody who doesn't view the fire service the, with the same zeal that that we may they can uh, everyone eventually over time will will be able to 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 see the merits and to see the the fruits of those labors you know over time and then as it gets validated on the fire ground and they st- uh, for me this is this is uh, has happened a handful of times where we've drilled on a particular topic especially something that may have been new to these firefighters or something that that's not typical to the way we operate and then we in that same shift caught a fire where those very um principles were put uh, were put to practice and it gave them that real life light bulb moment where those dots were con- were connected firsthand and now your stock just went dramatically up and oh. now people at, at, they ha- they have that that epiphany moment on their own and then over time as as your performance as the crew starts to go up other people are going to start to take notice the too confidence and in your competence just rises Exactly. Yeah. And when people start to, uh, to, to see that you're turning out faster, um, you're getting your, you may be, and I'm not, again, to, to make this clear, I'm not advocating to, to, to speed in a, ra- in a race to try and beat other companies, but by organically, you know, getting in faster by, by turn by getting out of quarters and getting dressed faster, um, you know, in, in be- beating companies into what's normally their first do. Yes. Um, when fires start going out faster, you're going to, people are going to start to take notice and they're going to start to at least be curious as to what Why? you're doing yeah. and how you're doing it. Um, so it's just it, it getting them in. And it's, I, I know from, from my personal experiences anyways, I feel that a lot of the, um, the negative perceptions uh, towards training and a lot of these cultures that, that don't foster, um, you know, the, this, this drilling environment and, and this growth mindset, a lot of it is, um, you know, the, the feelings of insecurity mm-hmm. or that, um, you know, fear, uh, fear of not, of, of not performing up to the, the level that's expected of them. Now, uh, I think it's important for us and, and I've been guilty of this and something that I I'm, uh, I'm trying to improve on every day. And it's, it's, making sure that we don't stoop to the level of, of, of others, especially if you know, people are being negative and they're throwing shots across the bow, don't stoop down to their level and start slinging the mud with them because it's going to, it's just going to bring you down and people aren't going to see where you're coming from. They're just going to see that you're slinging mud slinging and mud. it's just, it's just going to make, it's going to bring you down and that's all they're going to see is, is you, you know, acting poorly. Especially so what we need to, in today's social media, but sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. So wh- where that needs, it, we need to rely on on patience and in showing so, uh, these individuals some grace in the sense that this their their actions and their behavior may be a deflection of their own insecurities. Um, because let's let's look, like peel that onion back a, a little bit more and say, why are they acting this way? Why are they so averse uh, aversive to training? Well. Maybe it's because uh, when they came out of the academy, they got put at a, at a slow firehouse, and maybe it's because their company officer didn't invest in uh, invest in them and properly train them. And now you fast forward five, ten, fifteen years yeah. down the line, and now this individual has some time on the job, and people are looking at them in a certain light, especially that that as more time goes on. You know, the greater your tenure, the the, the higher in esteem, you know, you t- people typically look at you and the higher the expectations are. So now if you haven't been properly brought up and the environment that you were, weren't in, you're a, you're essentially a victim of circumstance. Right. And yes, we you know, we sh- people should have personal accountability, but it, it we can't expect everyone to to have that 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 initiative and that drive to go out on their own. And people just may not know where to go no, to, to find the information or may not have the financial or the means to go out there and, and seek that external trading, whether it's going right. to the conferences or and nothing, you know, find... nothing replaces that uh, personal accountability, like you said. No. But there's that dichotomy of that empathy, you know, of it, understanding it, where they it, come from. It's it's having that. And yes. 
Um, I think if we, we approach it with that sense and, you know, we, we work with these individuals and show them that, you know, we're, we're, we're willing to invest in them. And if you take the time and, and you know, show, you know, show these people, you know, you know, what you, what you may know, but do it in a way where, you know, you're not kind of grandstanding or, you know, you're, you know, you know, kind of you're directly, uh, you know, you know, tutoring them, if sure. you will, if you do it organically and, you know, you kind of like, as Jocko would say, flanking them. <laughs> and, and this could be, uh, and this is something I learned from, uh, uh, from John Vigiano. I had the, the, the great pleasure of actually getting to be in a small breakout session with him at a leadership under fire, uh, seminar nice. in, uh, in Maryland, uh, uh, before he passed away. And, uh, Vigiano was, was, is one of the, 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 biggest legends of, 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 mod, of the modern FDNY, one of the most highly decorated individuals uh, in the fire department's history. And this is one thing that he imparted on, on, uh, on our small group was when you're interacting with your company, you, uh, when you have, especially when you have a new firefighter and you're trying to you know, drill on a topic, make it, put the emphasis on that new firefighter. So that way it's that, the, the more senior firefighters feel comfortable. And then when it comes to, you know, getting them engaged, you give them the softball questions. So when you, when you, you're kind of, you know, uh, asking some leading questions, you give the softball question to the, the senior firefighter, something that you know they're going to be able to knock out of, out of the park. Not only does that build their confidence, it, but it gets them involved, but it right. also now that junior firefighter is now seeing that senior firefighter in a higher esteem because they're like, Oh wow. Like you, you, you knew that right off, right off the rip. Right. So it's the more you can do that. And it's like a lot of us are dealing with uh, an influx of newer firefighters oh, yeah. and more, you know, junior departments. So don't hone in on those, those uh, tenured incumbent firefighters that may not be up to snuff based on their time on the job, put the emphasis on, on the newer firefighters in, make it look, you know, seem like you're, you're just aiming to get them up to speed. And that way they're kind of vicariously, you know, in the mix, they're kind of absorbing it, uh, that information. And then over time, as that, as that, that information and that, that, uh, those skill sets become more commonplace. Now you start, you know, engaging them and, you know, throwing them, them those, then those, those softballs. And now you're building their confidence, you're getting them engaged. And it's that incremental process of, of building them up in a way that's not, you know, you coming at them is like, oh, that you should know this. And, I, you know, I'm going to lecture you and, um, you know, and, and coach you. It's especially if you're they're more of a peer to you. Sure. It's, you know, come at them in a way that that's uh, more unassuming and, 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 you know, keeps them disarmed in a way that you can you can really reach them and, and they can see the benefits. And, and over time, they're going to start to come around and as their confidence confidence builds, their their um, willingness to want to get involved is is going to increase as well. I like it. I like it. Final question is: heavy fire and searchable space. Would and I'm, I'm anxious to hear what the ventilation guy says. <laughs> the ventilation guy. But heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? <laughs> so my my ego immediately wants to say ves to make the grab because right in the fire service we deem you know making a grab and in, in, uh, affecting a rescue as being you know the the, the, high, like oh, the yeah. highest accomplishment Bowl, that yeah. you could achieve and you know we have great traditions with uh you know with with, with the you know, uh, awarding medals for for acts of uh, valor and in, in successfully rescuing uh, uh trapped victims and you know, so the, it, there's that that natural uh, inclination that it gravitates toward, towards that. But in my heart of hearts, to me, there there is nothing that that beats being on the pipe for a good job and you know, take, taking a feet at the end of a hand line. To, to me, that's there's there's no greater thrill on, that on earth than than making a good push in 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 you know knocking down that that fire and, and making the fire room and uh and you're getting to experience that lift and you know as the you know. The, the, the dust settles or the smoke lifts, if you will, you know, you getting to you know, see the fruits of your labor right bask, before you bask in and the glory of the nozzle work. So where, where the engine company is, is not going to get the medals and the outward recognition that the, the ladder company or whoever is performing your search functions may get in the event of a rescue, the engine company where their grat their gratification comes from is knowing that their actions 
allowed that rescue to be possible in the first place. Because the the line I, that I like to use is um, uh, the only thing that definitively restores order to the fire ground is an engine company in their hand line, period. Nice. All other actions on the fire ground are only possible because of that that properly operating hand line. You know, more lives have been saved. That that old that, that old line of the more lines have been saved by a properly uh, you know a, a positioned and operated hand line than by all other means. So the the engine company, and I'm glad this the the culture of the fire service has been changing and in, in giving the engine company their their due recognition because I like to make the uh, the the analogy again, the simple analogy because uh, you know a lot of uh, most firefighters love sports. The engine company is the John Stockton of the fire service. Okay. okay. Well, uh, the, the engine the company, assist, Carl. the engine company is is making the steals and providing the assists. Because remember, there is no Carl Malone without John Stockton. Love it, love it. And remember, John Stockton is still in the Hall of Fame for you know most uh, most career st- uh, steals and assists. So that's something to. I to, do love and, it. And if, and if you want, and it, and on that same thread, if you want a, a good read, uh, Vinny Dunn wrote an article about the engine company and you know their. Uh, their lack of, you know, that formal recognition in the fire service and how, you know, it, it, it's, it's a really great, great article. And he really talks about that. And, you know, even Andy Fredericks made a, made a pun once, I believe it was along the lines of uh, after, after a good job, the ladder company goes back to, to write up their metal reports while the engine company goes to the burn unit. So it was just <laughs> one little, little, little jab at the, at the ladder company. So it, it's, it's all in good fun, but. Uh, the I engine company it. needs to take pride in, in the work that they do because it, it, it's the, them extinguishing the fire and, you know, uh, taking and maintaining space that allows the other uh, the other functions to take place on the fire ground. I always like that's my favorite question out of all of them. I don't know what I'll do if I actually replace that question. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going to happen with the with the advent of the new questions for firefighters. But um, I love the the answers for that one. Max points on number five, because absolutely. I, I, I it's not about which one you pick. It's why. And that's what I love. And that, when, there, when there's passion behind it, um, I absolutely love it. So there it is. Five questions for firefighters. Scrap number 109 in the books. Nicholas Papa coordinating ventilation available from fire engineering. Uh, tell people how they can get a hold of you, reach out to you, book, uh, just whatever. Go. So if you, I'm, I'm pretty accessible. You can reach out to me at uh, fire, fireside training at yahoo.com if you want to email. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Facebook and I do have uh, an Instagram page. Uh, you know, it's at, at Fireside Training um, is the is the handle for that. I, I used to do um, uh, you know one one two a week uh, post on, uh, on the, that the page, and there there's still uh, there's a lot of content up there. I've kind of gotten away from that because I just didn't like the the short little snippets that that Instagram was was really kind of born for. So I I developed a, I have a website. It's uh, uh, Fireside Training dot org just make sure you remember that dot org um and i have a, a a formal website and i have all of my content on there from the articles that have been published uh the there's links that where you can purchase the book from uh the videos that i've done through the fire engineering training minutes as well as some other content and there's direct links to those social media pages from from there as well but i've kind of you know, transitioned more into doing one you know monthly blog and it's not as uh, some of them are, are lengthy, but I try to keep them to more of like a shorter, you know, blog format. Um, so it's more of just like a condensed article, if you will, instead of those short little snippets. Cause right. I like to get, I like to get in the weeds. I don't like to scratch the surface. So just look. I think a lot, a lot <laughs> well, that's left you, on the table. That's all you got today was just scratching the surface, man. So we're, we're going to have to a do another scrap, which I owe so many people a second scrap because so many surface <laughs> scratching that have been done. But I do mean that. I do mean that sincerely. I want you to come back and we can go. We can deep dive any of these topics. I mean, uh, just let me know. Um, and I've still got people I need to get on, including Rob Fisher, who's been commenting all night long. Um, go get a shirt. Hype the shirts. It says hype the shirts. Go get a hat. Mutts don't scrap. Firehousevigilance.com. There's like... I, I don't know. There's like 31 hats left of various colors, depending on which one you like. So they're, they're, that's all I've got left. I don't know when I'll get more. Uh, there's shipping containers stuck in shipping places all over the country, and you can't get hats no more. So that being said, um, guests coming up. I'm going to D.C. with the wife uh, this week, and then I'm catching Ben Martin and Mark Von Oppen, and I'm going to see Mark Davidson all out there at the uh, 
uh, commander fire commander conference in Virginia. Super pumped about that. So the next scrap is on November 1st. Super excited. Chief Dave McGrill, uh, been waiting for him to come on. It's going to be exciting. Followed by Danny Dwyer a few days later, then Kevin Lewis, Julio Ramos, and then Mo Davis. So the scrap is set up for success moving forward. What else do I have on here? Mention Next Rung and Amazon Smile. Um, man, I'm a big supporter of Blake Stennett and Next Rung. If you, have, if you shop on Amazon, go on there, turn on Amazon Smile, go pick Next Rung as the, if you don't have one already set up, I'm saying, but go and pick it because then every time you shop, they make money and it's a great cause. So uh, that's it. If you see me at a conference, ask to get a picture because I love taking pictures with people who listen to the scrap. That's it. Mutts don't scrap. Nicholas Papa, guest from number 109, sir. I Yeah, I can't wait to have you back. I look forward to it. It'll be fun. And for everyone listening, thank you for the comments, the questions. The audience is what makes the scrap so great. I hope the tone stays silent. Unless it's burning, please stay safe out there.